Initiating podcast download. Prepare yourself. Put on your spandex. Lace up your boots. Wrap your wrists. Hide your razor blade. Head to gorilla position. Grease up your hair. Apply baby oil. Okay, apply more baby oil. Get into gimmick. Keep your ears open and your mouth shut. Have fun and be safe out there, brother. Welcome to I'm on Wrestling. Now your host, Gregory Iron. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition, episode <laughs> seven of Iron on Wrestling. And I already hear you laughing, you son of a bitch, because you could tell that my voice is off <laughs> and I've been coughing before we started recording. You deserve to be in a coffin. Okay. I know you've been coughing, yeah. but you deserve to be in one right now, I- especially for that stunt you pulled last week by cutting me off of the show. What? I can't believe it. What are you talking about? Pardon the interruption. Yeah. Uh, Aaron Bauer here, but hey, what was her name? Eon Flux. Sarah Snyder. Yeah. My hey, beautiful friend, Sarah Snyder. It's never sounded so good when somebody said pardon the interruption than when she said it last week. Such an So I voice. do have to have to give credit on that one. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to clear the air right now. Sure. Uh, the intro that we did last week, uh-huh. it sucked. Yeah, well, so to be clear, it sucked. We did. We recorded an intro. <laughs> Let's just be honest with people. With, uh, Can we? with Aaron, Aaron was was present, and we did do an intro, and it just was not. Uh, it was not up to par. We had to, yeah. we had some actual interruptions <laughs> and some actual distractions, and by the time it my was, children's was here. Yeah, and by the time it was done, I think we both had a feeling of like, yeah, we can't even like use that. We and, even tried to do like this gimmick where they would come in and talk about their Halloween costumes or their favorite yeah scary wrestler or, or something. I I don't even remember right what, now what because was, we were I think we were both frustrated with the whole situation. Like we we had to do it we. Normally record on Mondays in my studio. Yes. Now, we had to record on Saturday because you're such a hardworking professional wrestler, athlete. Oh, oh, we're coughing again. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. oh wow, real professional. Yeah. We got an under the weather, mm-hmm. Gregory Iron today. Yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, we had uh, we had a lot of interruptions from these kids. We tried to record with them where they we gave them a spot to talk and honestly i i didn't hate it that much i didn't hate it but like i I hated us though i just because the whole time it was like the kids were like watching us and usually it's just you and i doing this but what it wasn't even a matter of them watching it like for me it was like they were sitting there and they were like whispering Mm -hmm. and like they were like wanting to chime in as we were talking right yeah so we were like fuck it we'll let them chime in yeah we'll get them in on the joke and like, right. they can talk about whatever so when it came time to, for them to actual talk <laughs> what the fuck did they do they just sat there right and then they didn't say anything well it was uh, it was the opposite of the time that johnny gargano had his final wrestling appearance in cleveland ohio oh yeah independent huge, wrestling appearance they were a huge part of that yeah, and, and he called my two youngest boys in the ring, Colton and Micah, and they got in the ring, and he was like, hey, let's have a moment here. Yeah. And he sat down Indian style with them, I mean, Native American style with them. Yeah. And Micah stood up and he said, uh, hi, Johnny. I can do a backflip like you. <laughs> yeah. And Johnny was like, okay, let's do it. Yeah. This is Johnny's re- basically retirement speech or however, f- uh, farewell speech. Yeah. And my son starts doing backflips in the ring, which he'd never done a backflip before in his life. Just first time, just busted out with Johnny Gargano. Yeah, so there it is. And, you know, good for him. And uh, I believe there was a crowd of at least like 500 in the arena. And uh, every wrestler from the roster, staff member, whatever, was around the ring. And they were all chanting, this is awesome. So good moment for uh, those dudes. It was uh, 2016... uh, Johnny's final match before going to NXT full time. It was Johnny and Candice essentially at first, and then it morphed into 
Johnny Gargano and Candice LeRae versus myself and Alex Daniels. And uh, how you doing? Good. Uh, so, what's this voice problem you're having? But I, I I do know that I had my voice when I started my venture out to the. Would you call it the Pacific Northwest, technically? That's what I would call it. Okay, so yeah, I, I spent my weekend... You're in- up in that uh, Roddy Piper, Scotty the Body, uh, Art Bar area? Yeah, yeah, yeah. see, I don't Portland. Right. So uh, it was my first time out there, and I was out there for 3 2 one Battle and uh, DOA Pro Wrestling. And uh, man, they treated me like uh, I was one of their own. It was really cool. But like when I got there, my voice was fine, and... Uh, when I was talking to the promoter, Steve West, of uh, 3 one Battle, incredible dude, uh, I, I, my voice was fine. And then I started planning my match, and then as I'm planning the match, my voice is just slowly disappearing. And I'm thinking mm. to myself, I, I, the way I'm calling this match is like I had to be very verbal uh, yeah. in the things that I was going to do. Because one of the participants in my match, it was a four-way with uh, Kikyo, which is a very talented female performer, uh, the Cruiser Bear. And are you ready for this guy? Yes. Jesus Christ Jr. Oh no! And uh, Jesus. The the uh, oh, I know him well. Yes, there there. I was planning some spots that needed uh, a lot of verbiage, and as I'm losing my voice, I'm thinking to myself, "Oh God, this isn't good." Because the story we were you were thinking, about, "Oh God," while well, you're speaking to Jesus, Jesus Christ Jr. Christ yes, Jr. Yes, exactly. Okay. So uh, I I I was worried I needed my voice for these spots. So the way we planned it was uh, four way. Two other participants, uh, Kikyo and the Cruiser Bear, they had just come back from injuries. Uh, we're circling. Jesus Christ Jr. notices my hand, and he immediately goes, my son, I would like to heal you. And I say, no, 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 I don't, I don't need you to heal me. I, I'm fine. This is how I make my money, and just leave me alone. And he starts hovering his hand above my hand. I'm like, get away from me, man. So then Kikyo and the Cruiser Bear, uh, they get very upset about this. They're like, hey, where were you when I was injured? And then Jesus is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, I, I'm a busy guy, one at a time, you know? And so we're arguing amongst ourselves. And uh, you get to the point where, you know, in my very hoarse voice. <laughs> hey, I, one at a time. I, I'm yeah, a busy guy. Hey, hey, that's, that's Jesus? Yeah, that's okay, Jesus. I'm okay. busy. Yeah, hey, calm down. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Jesus is part of the mafia. He might be. I like it. I don't know. Uh, so, so, uh, <laughs> as, uh, as we're arguing amongst ourselves, I don't want to be healed. They want to be healed. Uh, in my hoarse voice, I have to look at Jesus and go, Hey, this isn't our fault. This is your goddamn fault. And then we all oh. attack Jesus Christ Jr. You know, I, I use the Lord's name in vain. And we start beating his ass. And then he, we, he does like the big show spot. Like as we're beating wait, his wait, ass. Wait, so you're the baby face? Oh, yeah. They got a huge pop when we beat the shit out of Jesus. Wow. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Times it. are different. Crowd love. Well, comedy, bro. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, we're beating Jesus Christ Jr.'s ass. And then he does the big show spot, you know, where like everyone's on him and like he pushes uh, you off. God, so, I already know. So, 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 yeah. So like he pushes us all off <laughs> and like me and Kiko pop, powder out of the ring. And then, uh, long story short, you could barely. Too late. You could barely. Shut your fucking mouth. You could barely hear. Uh, most of the things I was saying, but the most important moment I managed to get out when I went up to the second rope and I did my trademark, suck my balls to Jesus Christ Jr. I specifically planning the match. I said, look, Jesus Christ Jr. I'm going to have to do this spot to you. So I got on the second. I said, hey, Jesus Christ, suck my balls. And it was probably the most over moment of the match. And you could hear me playing his day. But in general, my voice was gone. And uh, I'm so disgusted. Right I now. was. Uh, I was successful in defeating Jesus Christ Jr. I don't know if I could have lived with myself if I would have gone down in, de- in defeat. God so, damn, pal. Yeah, okay. Uh, but yeah, fun time, fun four way, even though I couldn't. Let me, let me ask you this. Yeah. When he said he was going to heal you, yeah. is that H E A L or is that H E E L, like the Renner Christ would have used? <clears throat> I get it. You like know insider terminology. Yeah. You're one of them smart marks. I'm the smartest of the marks. Okay, ridiculous. Uh, you know, but on top of being in that four-way, I had the pleasure of working with uh, uh, a very famous referee nowadays. Okay. You might have heard of her. She is the lead official for... Lead official? Lead official. Lead official. That's her name? Lead official. She's the lead official <laughs> for AEW now. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Are you talking about... Are you talking about Aubrey Edwards? Are you talking about Girl Hebner? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah which you, the so, best official. Hold on. Don't. Not because you worked with her, but because this is my honest opinion. Yeah. The best official 
in all of sports entertainment right now, uh, right above Jake Lemons. But seriously, uh, I love her. She's always, always on her mark. Yeah, she's awesome. She's, uh, she's, she's the best. She's only been doing it for a couple of years. Like I think people don't even realize that she's she hasn't been around. I don't. Know, I I never knew who she was. Yeah, and I'm just like finding out now. Oh, I, I knew all about her through three, two, one battle. So like when I got to the building, yeah. it, like it was like, it was cool for me because, uh, she came up to me and she said, Oh, I've always been a big fan of your work and I'm refereeing your match tonight mm. and it's going to be a blast. And, uh, you know, as we were talking, you know, I was just like, you know, I, I didn't get to tell you earlier, but like, uh, I've always been a fan of your work. You had me at Girl Hebner, you know, like what a yeah. creative name. And she told me that, like, you know, her husband was the one that came up with that because, like, she wanted like something witty. And her husband was just like, oh, "What about Girl Hebner?" And she was like, "Oh my god, that's, that's it, fantastic! You know? It's yeah. it's simple, but perfect." Yeah, but absolutely okay. perfect. So, uh, it, so the best thing about Aubrey was uh, the next day in, in uh, Saturday in Seattle. I had a seminar at three, two, one battle where I was going to teach a few of the young kids. And she really threw me off at the end of the night after my match and everything. And I'm making my rounds and saying goodbye. She said, okay, I'll see you tomorrow at the seminar. I was like, Oh cool. And in my head, I thought to myself like, what was she what? co? Yeah. Like what's she doing? Just hanging out. She helping yeah. like tighten up the ring or something. I don't, I don't know how she going to bump you know? for you in there. Or? Well, no, like I, I didn't even cross my mind that like she paid to be in my seminar. No on Saturday. Yeah. So like, uh, her okay, and, I didn't know this part. Yeah, Go ahead. so like uh, Saturday, I show up and there was like uh, five or six kids there. Yeah, and Aubrey, who again, if you are following AEW, she, hold on, she's basically the lead official for real. She main evented that you know, that championship match with Chris Jericho. Yeah, right? yeah, like like that cool clip where like she's in Jericho's face while he's right, bleeding right. everywhere and she's not backing down. Uh, she paid to be in my seminar, and I was like, and she know, really like. She respects you, dude. It she, sounds like like she is so professional. Like even when we're going through the match on Friday. So from port, hold, hold on. Sorry, I'm gonna keep interrupting you. That's my deal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she's from the Portland area. I believe she's from Seattle. Okay, so or yeah, Seattle. whatever, Seattle. Okay, so she's uh, that Pacific Northwest, but she knows of your work. Yeah. You, Greg Rarin, from Cleveland. I know you travel all over the place. Yeah. And I know you had that very successful show on uh, uh, Sports Time Ohio called Prime Wrestling yeah, or yeah, PWR. Yeah, yeah. So maybe she was a fan there, I guess. No, but but, but like, the how does she know you other I mean, would she follows you? Pro- probably the internet, dude. What's the internet? It, it, you know, it's, it's made the world a lot lot smaller. Okay. You know, everything could be watched and seen on the internet. So she follows your stuff. I guess, yeah. Or unless she was just lying, but I don't think she was. Well, who cares? I mean, she paid to be in your seminar, right? Oh, I got a cough. <laughs> he's oh, gonna God. you um, want some coffee huh no okay huh uh, but no so uh she paid to be in the seminar and uh i noticed the night before during during the match when we were planning it like she wanted to know like specific spots and like moments in the match and like she was taking notes in a notebook and then you know when she was at the seminar uh i pulled her aside and said hey why are you doing my seminar <laughs> like you're, you're incredible and yeah. she was just like she's like i i still want to learn and like, so wait, wait, wait she she works like she wrestles too? No. So she's she's strictly she, a referee. Yeah, she never wanted to be. Anything but wants like all the knowledge. Yeah. So she had. Like I a, uh, oh my god! I love her even more now. Yeah. So she had a uh, she had a notebook with her, and uh, she was like, she just told me like, I I just I love doing seminars and like getting different perspectives, and like I I'm still growing and learning. And she's I, like, the best. Like, dude, she she's amazing. Like, and yeah. and uh, we had this deep conversation, which I really appreciated. She's like, she's like, I. I enjoy your work because, you know, you, you always say that, like, you don't want to be looked at as like this handicapped pro wrestler. You just want Mm -hmm. to be a good pro wrestler. And like, I don't want to be looked upon as a, just a female referee. I just want to be looked at as a good referee. And I was like, man, I feel that 100%. Oh, you just blew my mind. It's like, uh, uh, it's like the same, but it's different. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So like, okay. it, so, so we just connected. And it was cool. And yeah. another person that did the seminar that I really appreciated being there was a guy by the name of Steve Miggs. I, you might not know him, nope. but he's very big in the Seattle area. He's he's the biggest. I know Scotty guy. Riggs. <clears throat> That's a completely different human being. Okay. But uh, Steve Miggs. <laughs> Steve Miggs. Okay. Uh, he is the biggest DJ mm. in the Seattle area, and so he's been on the rock station there for two decades. And he's I think he's forty five years old. And he decided to Ooh. start pro wrestling at right. 41. Okay. And so, 
yeah so like so he he was at my seminar and so we, he wrestles he wrestles yeah like like okay pretty, pretty, pretty regularly in that area for like three two one battle and defy and uh, a couple places in Washington there and obviously we wrestled that doA on Sunday which is like it was just kind of shocking because like I don't know like uh, you've been around wrestling just as long as I have and like longer I've longer but like you you often find that like celebrities or just people in general who like don't I guess I guess they underestimate the rigors of pro wrestling. Yeah. They just think like maybe if I pay some money or whatever, or, or like if I have this idea for a character, like I could just, no, be, I could just be in. Yeah. Yeah. But like Steve, like he not only on Saturday, but on Sunday when I got the opportunity to wrestle with him, he really went above and beyond the call of duty of showing. It's like, look, I take this shit like very, very seriously. And he's right. got like, he's got like your stereotypical, like, and I don't really want to say like stereotypical cause that's like selling it short, but like, you know, his mindset that he explained to me was like, he hates these disc jockeys that like take themselves too serious. And like, they think like they, they're the guy, you know what I mean? And so like, so in like a wrestling persona, they're like, Oh, everyone should love me. And I'm like this big celebrity. So like, he like, he plays off of that. Like he, he, he becomes that guy. Like kind of like, uh, like remember when like man cow was in like WCW and like, like he was like, or maybe you don't remember. Cause like it, that was during yeah, the dark days. Like I don't think I wanted 000. to remember. Yeah. Literally they did man cow versus Jimmy Hart yeah. on two different pay-per-views. Why did that happen? Like, like not even back oh, to back. Oh, excuse me. I'm throwing up right now. Yeah, it's now really bad. Yeah. So yeah. Miggs likes to play up this, like, I'm verified on Twitter, like, blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, just, okay. Just, okay. Like, so like, he's in on the joke. Yes. And he has. I this, like it. He, he made this verified championship, which is why we were having a oh, match on Sunday. Yeah. So, like, super cool belt. Like, like very well done. I think it was. Wait, like, what's the belt look like? It's got a huge check mark on it. Yes, it play. does. It's got, it's got, it's got the yeah. little, it's got the little birds on the side. Yes, it's, it's got his Twitter handle on it. So Good for him. It, like he told me, like it's basically uh, a million dollar cool. belt. Uh, go ahead, keep talking because uh, I'm gonna follow him right now. Do it, do it. So like, what is he, this is Twitter, right? Uh, I think it's or I is am, it Instagram? Twitter and Instagram. I am Steve Miggs. Okay. But go ahead, uh, talk a little more. I'm yeah. gonna go do this. Yeah, no, he's uh so he came to the seminar and like he picked my brain and like it's very strange for me, even though I've been doing more and more seminars to be in this position where it's very weird thirteen years in that I'm in this position where I get to sh- share my knowledge and like just psychology and like talk about like layers of characters and like the importance of positioning and timing in the ring. And like Steve was really all about absorbing that knowledge in. And then so come Sunday when we're working together, he just, he, like, I, he shocked me, quite frankly. Like, he had, like, great ideas for the match and just, uh, we we vibed really well. And uh, I, I we probably went, like, 15 minutes and uh, it was probably one of my favorite matches I've had all year. So it just goes to show that, like, you know, if you want something, uh, all you have to do is really work for it. And, like, Steve Miggs is an example of a guy who doesn't want anything handed to him just based on his celebrity status, you know? And same with Aubrey. You know, she she's in a position right now where she's one of the most prolific referees in the entire industry, and yet she's still out there willing to learn and, like, just busting her ass. And, like, I can't I can't get enough of it. Did you just give Steve Miggs a follow? He's followed. He's followed. Okay, good job. So yeah, so that was that was my weekend working with with people that like you know they don't you you think like you know they've they've learned enough, but like it just goes to show that in professional wrestling you never stop learning. I'm still learning. In fact, some of the people that did my seminar, I feel like I picked some shit up from them this weekend. So it was really cool. It was just a really great experience. But this whole rambling brings me to a topic I wanted to discuss. Yes. Steve Miggs works very hard, uh-huh. even though he doesn't have to, because he has this "quote unquote" celebrity status. But there's so many people that get into wrestling that think like, "I just want to fucking breeze by and be in pro wrestling." And we've been around a lot of those guys before that aren't sure just celebrities, have. just guys that think like if they pay a few bucks, they could be on the show, right? Right, right. Or if at least they say they'll pay a few bucks. <laughs> oh, it's a, are you thinking of the same guy that I'm thinking of? I think I'm thinking of who you're thinking I'm thinking of. So back in Pro Wrestling Ohio, the promoter had this great idea that he wanted to get a money mark for the show. Um, now, in wrestling, if you don't know the term money mark, I'm sure you know the term smart mark, uh, but a money mark in wrestling is someone that uh, insists that they will provide some sort of currency, money, financial input into the show 
and in exchange, like you kind of like give them this dangling carrot of like they get to do something on the show, right? Like, dangling. They, like, like they get to like uh, be a part of a storyline or like manage someone or like or or, or you, some you just, of these guys think they'll end up uh, holding a championship. Well, that was this guy that we're about to talk about. <laughs> this man. Goes by the name of yeah, I don't even know what was his actual name, Mister. No, 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 no. What oh. was his actual name though? Dude, I, you got I, me. I, I don't know. Like, cause I, 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 I mean, if I like really thought about it and stuff, it was, but I try like, not to go back that far. It was in like my... Bob or some some bullshit. <laughs> but but so you, you see, no, no uh, uh, okay, William or something. I don't know, William. But like, uh, so here's how he gets introduced. So we find out that that Wally, the promoter, has found this money mark. William, so uh, so this money mark is is booked on the show now. The, the his deal is he is a security guard, but he's also the coach for like a little league or a school f- football team. Yeah, like the the elementary school flag football team, like fifth and sixth graders. Yeah, yeah. Something. So so like I'll never forget the name of the show because me and Gargano made fun of it all the time. The name of the show on the poster was. Do you remember? I I remember. I hated the name Powder Keg, but I know that's not it. That's de- no. This was the worst. It was called Slam Down for the Cowboys. Because <laughs> they were the uh, they, they, middle school cowboys yeah, they or were whatever. Like the, yeah. I don't know the Brunswick Cowboys or some <laughs> bullshit like that. So so the show was like uh, Slam Down for the Cowboys. So me and Johnny, because like we would all we always just do stupid shit to annoy the promoter, like. Uh, we we like made a song that we occasionally, we occasionally still sing. Where because like the the name was so bad, we we're like slam down for the cowboys. Like you can't put that on a poster. It's like slam down for the cowboys, baby. Slam down for the cowboys, baby. And like the promoter would just get really annoyed by us because that's what yeah. we did all the time. So this guy shows up. That's the coach for these cowboys. And I will never fucking forget during intermission he gets introduced now at this point he's not technically a part of the show yet right. but he will be like the next month oh yeah he comes out and he cuts this promo and i remember i'm standing next to johnny and i don't know what the fuck he's saying but all i know is i tune in as soon as i hear him go because i'm your coach and my name is mr and at the time Yo, this is like 2009. Yeah. Um, I look at Johnny, and Johnny looks at me, and I'm like, he's not doing this right now. No. Because Mr. Kennedy is very much on TV on a regular basis. And he says, Mr. And then whatever the fuck his actual name was. Yeah. Because at the time, he didn't have his PWO name, which right. you came up with. <laughs> Tell me about that. So, so, so he does this show as like, it's a charity show for these cowboys. Yep. And now, because he's going to be a quote unquote money mark, now he's going to be on the show on a regular basis. You're right. Untrained. And no experience. After this show, later on in the week, the promoter Wally called me and he said, Aaron, I want to put this guy with you. He's going to bring us a lot of money, he's going to take us to the next level. So much money, but he wants to be used on the show. We don't fully trust him yet because he says he's going to donate this money, but also that he's going to train to wrestle. And he could be a future champion. He's a, a, he told us he was a high school star, athlete, uh, college football player, et cetera, et cetera. He's got a good lineage, he's got a good background. We want to bring him in, but we don't trust him with just anybody. He's got to be with you. You have to show him the ropes. One, because nobody else <laughs> will do it without stiffing him or, or hurting him or being disrespectful to him. But we think we can use him. So I'm company guy, and I love a good challenge. So I says, yeah, yeah, who is this guy? He was that high school football coach or that uh, junior high football coach, middle school football coach, whatever. Okay, so what are we going to do? He's going to be your bodyguard. He's going to guard your money. That's what we're going to have him do. I said, oh, okay, so if he's going to guard the money, uh, let's just make it something easy so everybody knows. So Brinks, 
uh, trucks bring security is, I guess, what guards money. And this guy's going to guard money. So let's call him Mr. Brinks. Tremendous. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're real easy. I don't know. Nothing. Uh, but he's also, he's going to guard me. And he's going to guard whoever I'm managing at the time. Yeah. And he thought he was going to be champion. Oh, yeah. I mean, this guy talked to me about it. And he had this feud all set with Bain, who was our big, you know, our, our big heater, our big uh, uh, baby face star, huge. Yeah. You know, whatever. Big, so. big baby face monster, essentially. Yes. But he he had size, Mr. Brinks did. Yeah. He was a big guy. He just didn't know anything about wrestling. He didn't know how to wrestle. He saw it on television. Yeah. So here's here's a funny story that you bring up that he wanted the belt because one day Mr. Brinks walked by Johnny, Johnny Gargano had the championship belt on his shoulder and Mr. Brinks walks by him and goes and like we're not filming anything, I'm pretty sure the show's over and he goes, watch out champ, that belt's gonna be my soon and Johnny just like looked at him like and said okay man like because he's like what what is this guy what is wrong with him so like so like he he would say shit like that all the time. One time, I don't even know if I ever told you this, I had to go to a, do a radio interview, like local radio, um, some FM station in Cleveland. It was me and Mr. Brinks. Right. Okay? Now, mind it. you, he's just a security guard on the show. Yeah. And because he's bigger than me, like, I, how how tall would you say he is? Like, 6'3"? Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. pretty big and, like, pretty, he had some size. Like, he's probably, like, 300 pounds. He's over 300 pounds. So... Uh, so we're at this radio station and like people that, are like, hold on. I want people to picture Mr. Hughes. Yeah, that's it. Or Carl Winslow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay. he, he probably looks more like Carl Winslow. He probably did. Mr. Uh, either Mr. Way. Mr. Hughes is intimidating. Like Carl Winslow is like, you know, like yeah. he could have been more yeah, like a right, Carl right, Winslow. Right. Okay. okay. So anyways, so we're in this radio station and like people are like saying hi to me or whatever. And, and like, so I, I don't pick up on it right away. But then all of a sudden, these these DJs are going to this guy, Mr. Brinks. So how long have you been a wrestler? And he's like, and he goes, I've just been doing it for a few months now, you know, like like uh, just getting some training in and stuff, you know. It's been going really well. Like I'm hoping to go for the belt soon. And like I, I'm getting the impression that no, that they think I'm I'm like this handler. Yeah. For for this bigger wrestler here. Uh, I could see I'm it. Yeah. Five, four and like. Have a gimp hand? In all fairness to everybody, I would have thought the same. Yeah, but like, but yeah. but my, my thing was, this guy didn't bother to be like, oh, no, 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 I'm not a wrestler. Yeah, yeah, this here's guy the right star. Here is the wrestler. Right, right, right. But, like, he, but would, he couldn't do that yeah. because he didn't have, like, my mentality where yeah. I was like, let's always put the focus on, on the actual wrestler well, because, as opposed to me who sucks. Because he's just a delusional dumbass who didn't want to do any hard work that came along with... <laughs> With being in the wrestling business, he just wanted to tell his. But friends, he was going to pay, oh, thousands of yeah, dollars. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, I think that's a very important part of the story here because uh, turns out that he never contributed a goddamn dime to right. the show ever, and he was on the show for a year yeah. to the point that, like, you brought it up to me earlier, like Hobo Joe in the locker room one time. My uh, favorite. T- tell tell me that. Okay, so we're in a locker room in I believe Niles, Ohio, and we're backstage and we're getting this big speech about how. Uh, we got money coming in, and we also are going to be bringing in Kevin Nash yes. to PWO. Yeah, too sweet. Okay. So, as we're going to bring in Kevin Nash, and as we have all this new money coming in, uh, things are going to be looking bright for our fledgling professional wrestling independent promotion that's on television. And Hobo Joe... Of all people. And I don't know. Nobody probably knows who Hobo Joe is or whatever. But Hobo Joe was just this little dude that was like, I think maybe your partner sometimes. He, he was he was, he was my partner sometimes. He's just a homeless character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just, and he's never spoken up about anything in his life. And he was just pissed. Not, not in front of the whole locker room. But right, right, right. Hobo, Hobo Joe was very Right, he's not, he's not, he's not a, a locker room leader or anything. Yeah. He's just a guy that falls in line and does what he's told. Yeah. Instead... He speaks up and he goes, so we got a money mark that ain't brought money to the whole promotion the whole fucking time he's here. 
<laughs> yeah, it was real awkward because Wally started rambling about about uh, how great this uh, money market. Yeah, was. yeah, but yeah. like he's never contributed a dime, so it was a real piece of garbage. Um, uh, you know that reminds me of another person that came into PWO for a second. Um, so this was right in the infancy of PWO, and uh, so it was like 2007. And I remember one night we're in the back, me and Gargano are sitting there, and uh, at the end of the show. Pedro DeLuca, the ring announcer, announces to the crowd, you know, he's saying like the good night greetings, have a safe trip home. And he says, and don't forget to come back next month to see the mysterious new wrestler, Wrestler X. And then me and Johnny look at each other and go, who the fuck is Wrestler X? Now, mind you, at the time, me and Johnny were helping write and produce the show on the down low. We don't know who this guy is. So we go up to the promoter later that night. We go, hey. Who's wrestler X? And he goes, Oh, uh, uh, you know that air conditioning commercial we have on the show? I'm like, Yeah. And he goes, Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he he wants to pay money so he can like uh, wrestle next month. And uh, so what we're gonna do is he's gonna be under a mask. And he requested that he he wants to wrestle like two little guys, and he just wants to throw them around. And and me and Johnny look at each other. Of course. Like, oh, what boy. the f- fuck, man? So this guy. I forget his name. He ends up coming to training one day. Okay. And all he keeps saying is that he wants to, he wants to throw around a couple of the guys and do some soufflés. Oh yeah. He just wants to do some soufflés. Oh, he's like a Gordon Sully guy. Yeah. And so, so, uh, we tell him, uh, well, you know, you gotta like, you gotta learn how to bump first, man. And he's like, Oh, I don't, I'm not, I don't want, I just want to throw guys around. Yeah. yeah of course. And, and so like, we're like, you gotta bump, man. And then, uh, so he takes one bump, and this guy is like mid forties. Yeah, takes one bump, and this is gonna shock you, not in shape at all. Okay? Right, <laughs> takes one bump, knocks the fucking wind out of himself, and gets up. He goes, "Oh, that really hurts." And we're like, "No shit, moron." <laughs> yeah. And so like, so then like, uh, he gets up and he looks at like I think it was either Bobby Beverly or Ben Boo. He's like, "You want to do that? You go ahead and do that. Like, show me how you do it." And then so like, obviously these guys who've been fucking training as wrestlers <laughs> then take like. A couple Several dozen bumps in a row, right, right, to show right. him like yeah, we could take him, so. and then yep. he's like, he's like, uh, I, 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 I'll just watch, and he doesn't take one more back pump, yeah. and the match never ends up happening. But he keeps trying to pitch to Wally that he wants to wrestle two guys in a hand mm-hmm. cam match and do some flays to them, and he was gonna pay money for it. And like, luckily, me and Johnny were able to nix it because why the fuck would that happen on the show for no reason? His name was Wrestler X. Who's gonna wear a fucking mask? <laughs> I love all of it. It was stupid. No, no, no. It's great. It's great in my mind. Oh, God. No, it's terrible. Is, is, are there any like success stories other than Steve Miggs that you know of when it comes to like guys who are like they weren't from the wrestling world but they like busted their ass? I know a guy uh, back around ninety nine two thousand. There's this uh, skateboarder who was like uh, the baddest ass skateboarder in the world. Mike Vallely, and I believe he did like an interview or something where he had talked about always wanting to be involved in wrestling. So the guy I had trained with, I've talked about him in the past, uh, Sal, he is a big skateboarder. And somehow he found out about, you know, Mike V wanting to be a wrestler, uh, read this article, whatever, and emailed him and said, hey, I'm part of this promotion, local indie fed out in Ohio, like by Cleveland. Uh, if you're interested in getting a match or something, you know, I, re- I read your story. Uh, we'd love to have you out here. So Mike V, like I-, I would say within a day or two, emailed back and was like, hey, dude, I'm all in. Oh, wow. So then it was like, okay, well, what's it going to cost to get him here? Well, he comes from California. So obviously it'd be a flight we'd have to pay and then whatever his fee would be because yeah, not that I was big into skateboarding, but a lot of people in the area around Cleveland, Lorraine, Elyria, uh, Amherst, stuff like that, a lot of skateboarding fans around. Sure. So they would want to see him. And he could do little appearances at, like, skate shops and stuff like that to promote. So, 
Uh, Mike V, coolest dude ever, says, uh, I, I'll pay my own flight. I'm going to bring a camera crew from this video magazine, 411, out. They can document everything, and we'll put it on, like, a, an actual, like, movie, like a video. Um, I don't want any pay. My only request is that, like, I have this angle that I'd like to do where, like, uh, maybe I'm in the crowd or something, and I'm a skateboarder, and a wrestler says, oh, you're a skateboarder? Why don't you come up and face a real wrestler? And I get in a ring, and I say, "Hey, man, I got this promo in mind. Hey, man, I'm gonna, uh, I'm a skateboarder. I take my falls not on a padded mat. I take my falls on the concrete, and then that wrestler beats the shit out of me. Nice. And I want to go through a table." But I want it to be, like, from a power bomb off the top rope. <laughs> Very specific. Yeah, and it was like, hold on, dude. You know, this is probably going to end badly. This is probably all going to be to the bad. This It sounds too good to be true, right? Yeah. Mike V shows up on his own dime, comes in. He's got the, uh, the guy from 411 Magazine, like he said he would. Uh, they're filming. It's a camera crew. There's uh, him... Uh, he wants no pay at all. He just wants to hang out. He gives he he does uh, publicity before the show for like the day. Uh, maybe like if the show was on like a Friday or on a Saturday, he went and did skate shops, uh, autograph appearances, and to promote the show. Um, the day before, made sure he stayed long, autographed everybody's posters, everything at these skate shops. That's awesome. Uh, he he was so. So cool. Yeah. Did everything. And all he wanted was to do the angle that he had pitched, which we were okay with. Sure. I mean, you know, we had sold out the show already. So there were going to be four or 500 people already in this building. Yeah. So we we were excited about that, obviously. Uh, he had already made good on all of his other promises. We uh, set up the angle. And he was going to work with my trainer, which was Rod Destiny. And Rod, uh, they were going to do a spot where Mike was going to try to get into the ring. And he was going to try to springboard into the ring. Okay. So he springboards from outside to, you know, he jumps onto the top rope and then to springboard in. But Rod super kicks him as he's coming in. And he takes a back bump over the top rope and into like, uh, it had to be like the seventh row of chairs. <laughs> nice. Like, he killed himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and, it really went above and beyond what he had to do. Yes. And so, like, immediately, that was the first thing. So then, Rod goes outside the ring, picks him up, throws him into the ring, takes him up to the top rope, had already put a table in the ring, whatever. And then, I, I think Rod uh, power bombed him. Like, Mike went for, like, a, a, a Frankensteiner or something like that off the top rope. Uh. And Rod power bombed him through a table off the top rope. I mean, it was nuts, and the whole place was going crazy. Just what he wanted. And there were yeah, and there was signs, Valley three hundred and sixteen, because that's what Mike Mike V shirts said. And yeah. uh, he gave everybody that was there, me, my wife at the time, a couple of our friends, Sal, uh, all these Valley three hundred and sixteen shirts where it said Valley three hundred and sixteen, and on the back it said. Um, skateboarding is my life but before all this happened while we were just like going through in the afternoon of what we we're gonna do like he took time to like there was a couple kids there that like may have been there they were wrestling fans but uh they were like the dj son the dj was prepping um there was uh, uh sal himself uh, a couple other people it was like if you want to get in the ring with mike you know, if, if you wanted to get in with Mike V, who had been on, like, Jackass and uh, CKY, beating people's asses, uh, he's no joke. I mean, he's, a, he's a real, real motherfucker. Yeah. Um, I've seen videos. Right, right. You you get in the ring with him, you know, and, and people were, like, working with him, wrestling. And he had trained at that real, uh, that famous school, like, in California. Ultimate Pro Wrestling. What? Ultimate Pro Wrestling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like... Like, he knew what he was doing already. He had been training for this moment, yeah. and we were giving him his moment, I, I felt like. That's really cool. Yeah, and and the dude was just the best professional, and I wish, like, because we booked, like, this this match then in a few months. 
where it was going to be Rod Destiny versus Mike V, where they were going to have an actual match. And Mike was going to go back and get the rest of the training that he needed, and then he was going to wrestle Rod. And there was a fire code violation, day of the show, mm. where the fire department shut down our show. Yeah. And Mike had already flown himself in again to to have this match. Yeah. We weren't paying him anything. Oh, boy. We weren't even paying for his flight. Yeah. He flies from California to Cleveland mm-hmm. and he doesn't even get his match because we got shut down that day. That sucks. Uh hard times there, man. And I really, really I hated everything about that. And I remember um it, there were hundreds of people outside lined up and I had to stay there because I was kind of, I was the rookie or whatever and I was managing Mike V, yeah. but I had to stand outside and turn people away. Like <laughs> that was my job that day Yeah, was to tell people there's not going to be a show. Oh, okay. oh, it was rough, man. Did, you never stayed in contact with them after that? Not much. Uh, maybe a couple times. I think like we're friends on Facebook okay. or whatever, but, um, I just talked to Sal and I asked him if there was any chance he could talk to Mike, Mike V and then see if like maybe we could get together sometime. It just even over the phone or whatever. And then like, just talk. Yeah. Cause I want to know, I want to know everything that happened after this. Cause I, I really don't know much after that. I know he wrestles a match. I'm, I know he wrestled Frankie Kazarian. Yeah. A few times. That makes sense because Kazarian came up in California too. Right, right. So, I, I mean, I think the guy has a very interesting story. Yeah. I mean, uh, he's been in the movies uh, Paul Blart, the mall cop. Yeah. A couple of those movies. Yeah. Uh, that movie Triple Triple X with... Uh, Vin Diesel. Vin Diesel. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and a few other movies. So, like, this dude's legit, man. That's awesome. And, and he's a great dude. Yeah. You know, he does a lot of charity work. Yeah. Um, so, good deal, man. So Yeah. So, well, you know, it's good that there's occasionally good dudes from outside of the wrestling world that enter the wrestling world and take it very serious because I feel like we take wrestling very, very serious. And, uh, I mean, not too serious, but serious <laughs> like, enough. Don't you know? take it. Yeah, you yeah. You got to create logic out of the illogical world of pro wrestling, right? But, uh, hey, something I seriously want to talk about is my upcoming weekend in pro wrestling. Before I do that, I do want to backtrack and just once again thank 321 Battle, Steve West for the opportunity there this past weekend, and Ricky Gibson from Four Minutes of Heat, great tag team out in that area, Portland and in Seattle, for giving me the opportunity at DOA Pro Wrestling. But this weekend is one of the biggest matches of my career. And this is a rematch long time coming. Back in 2012, we wrestled each other for the first time, and it was like, a dream come true. And is if you this know us? We, you and me? No, that's not. No, we oh. did wrestle in prison, though, which we will talk about one day. But uh, if you know anything about Gregory Iron, you know that Gregory Iron doesn't exist without Zach Gowan. And I wrestled him for the oh. first time in August of 2012 in a one-on-one match that essentially, uh, it when that match was pitched, we didn't want to do it because we thought uh, people would view it as a cripple fight. We immediately went to South Park in our brains and said like people are gonna like <laughs> laugh at this yeah and we never talked about it once it was like set in stone that it was gonna happen but i remember like that weekend for some reason it popped in my brain what the the story of the match was and it was we aren't two disabled wrestlers we're just two pro wrestlers and somehow zach was on the same page that day and i and we had like similar ideas for the match and like it's till this day one of my top favorite matches of all time. And like, when I go back and watch that match, I feel like I was in the best shape of my life and I moved different and I had extra tan that day. Like I was like, I was ready to go because like, I don't know. Yeah. It was like, you know, he was the reason why I became a wrestler and I wanted to be my absolute best. And this Saturday in Southgate, Michigan for the second time and maybe the last time ever, Gregory Iron versus Zach Cowan, one-on-one, and it's for a great cause. It's a Gavin Quinn appreciation show. Basically, all the proceeds are going to benefit our good friend Gavin Quinn, GQ, who had to retire from wrestling this past year, impromptu, basically, because he ended up going to the hospital and finding out that he had some medical issues that he didn't know existed, and because of these issues, uh, he could no longer compete. And he's a great dude, uh, one of my closest friends in the business. I've worked a lot with him. 
in Michigan and especially in old wrestling that Marion Fontaine runs and just, just a great, great dude. So if you're near Southgate, Michigan, anywhere in the Detroit area, I encourage you to come out to the show, support GQ, all proceeds go to him and you're going to get to see a hell of a contest between me and Zach. And we're, this is definitely not something we're going to half ass. Not that we ever half ass it, but like if you are used to seeing Gregory Iron and Zach Allen at 110%, Get ready to see us at 220% this weekend because this is a match we're both looking forward to. And even though we've done so much in this business, we still have a lot to prove. So that's this Saturday night, November 9th, 2019. Also, coincidentally, the anniversary of the Survivor Series screw job. Why do I know that date off the top of my head? I don't know. I'm fucking pathetic. Well, but- you know all those dates, and you know the attendance, and you know the city and uh, the nearby city. Yeah. I'm, and uh, the first guy that bought a ticket. I'm and Very sad, very yeah. sad. Uh, then Sunday, I will be remaining in the Michigan area as I wrestle and I return to XICW. And that hey, I've be, worked there before. Yeah, I'm going to be working Is for that for DBA? DBA, brother. I'm going to be working for DBA. That's going to be Sunday, November 10th at 5.30 p.m. When you get there, t- tell me whatever happened at Joey Bag of Donuts. I will ask around. Thank you. That's a very creative name. But that's uh, Sunday, November 10th. So, again, if you're uh, going to be in Warren, Michigan, I encourage you to come out. 24300 Hoover Road, Warren, Michigan. I believe tickets are just 10 bucks. I think that's worth uh, coming to the show. When I was there, I was managing Bad Boy Hito from FMW uh-huh. against Balls Mahoney. And we've talked about him in the past. Yes. And uh, Balls was great that day. Yeah. And uh, so was Hito and... I think we worked in uh, Hot Rocks. Continue. Are you okay? Yeah. Are you okay? Yep. Okay. So I didn't know if I had to do mouth to mouth. Um, Hot Rocks parking lot. Do you know anything about that? No. Okay. Eminem talked about it in uh, some of his songs. Okay. Rapped about it. Uh Uh-huh. I think uh, him and the Insane Clown Posse had a maybe a fight there, okay. and then him and a, a security guard had a fight there. Oh, Anyways, I, I, I did hear about that fight. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the Hot Rocks parking lot. So uh, we were working shows there for a while, and really cool. Like the week before, uh, Eminem had this altercation, which I didn't even know who Eminem was at the time. Yeah. I don't think many people knew. But what, yeah, what I was there. What year is this? We, we talking about? Uh, what are we looking at? 90... Nine, ninety eight, ninety nine, something like that. So I'm bad with. So ninety eight would have been like right before the rise of Eminem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, that's my little trivia on that. But uh, yeah. we were there a couple weeks right before Eminem had these altercations that were going on with. I believe it was a security guard. Maybe it was ICP. Not sure. But the Hot Rocks parking lot, you all get shot. Okay. okay. Whether it's your fault or not. All right. Because I'm a soldier. Calm down. We have talked a lot about a lot of stuff today. But we haven't even talked about our guest Yep. today. Guest on Iron On Wrestling, Gentleman Jervis. He has been wrestling for about, I think, seven or eight years now. He's one of the most lovable, one of the most huggable professional wrestlers in the industry. You guys might know him from his time in Chikara. He's still very, very active on the independent wrestling circuit, working a lot in championship wrestling from Hollywood, a lot of places in the California area. And he's got such a interesting story. He's a student of the game, and I think this is one of the more, I guess, serious interviews that I've had with someone. And we we touch on a lot of uh, a lot of difficult subjects. And I I he even got me to open up a little bit on some stuff that like I don't often talk about on podcasts because he was just so open and candid about his childhood and his experiences with mental health. And I feel like you know, 2019, we live in a day and age where. We know a lot more about mental health and the seriousness of it, and we really delve into some, to some shit. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to talk about it much longer. I think we need to delve into it right now. You guys are going to love this interview with Gentleman Jervis. Let's go to that interview. Wabam! Gentleman Jervis right now. I've got an important question for all you wrestling fans out there. Are you looking for hard-hitting wrestling journalism that is every bit as trustworthy and fact-based as professional wrestling itself? Well, then you've got no choice but to check out kayfabenews.com. Kayfabe News is unreal news about an unreal sport. It's the world's premier wrestling news site. Well, not exactly. I guess it's more like The Onion, but it's entirely about pro wrestling. 
you've surely seen some of the headlines. I'm talking like Hogan tells brother something, Cena visits injured self in hospital, or Lashley brashly lashes back at backlash as a mismatch of trashy squash matches. They've even written a story about yours truly defeating Brock Lesnar for the Universal Championship at an indie show in Cleveland, and you never know, that might come true someday. But this isn't about me. This is about Kayfabe News, and I strongly encourage you to check out all the stories on kayfabenews.com. And hey, if you have some time, they've got a hilarious new YouTube show, which drops every Tuesday at youtube.com backslash kayfabenews. And you know I have a great t-shirt collection. I've got a bunch of great shirts that I've gotten that support Kayfabe News, and you can get your very own just by going to prowrestlingtees.com backslash kayfabe news. Kayfabe News, remember, it's not fake news. It's unreal. We are sitting in Los Angeles, California, in the lovely home of one gentleman, Jervis. We've been spending the evening together eating a little chicken and rice, having some conversations. Good time. Uh, good longtime friend of mine, Jervis. How the heck are you, pal? Oh, Gregory, I'm doing so well. Thank you for having me. I'm really delighted to be here. Oh, thank you for inviting me over. I don't get to see you enough. I, I haven't seen you in about, uh, well, about a year. Uh, I think uh, I saw you at Old Wrestling last year, and then I saw you for a second when I came into town to do a documentary, which you made a little cameo on. That's right. Um, what was it called? Wrestle Days? Wrestle Days, yeah. Wrestle good, Days. Good people. Danny and Keith. Uh, I love them. Producing those Wrestle Days documentary. I saw you at Championship Wrestling from Hollywood, and uh, mm-hmm. that was my first time there, but you wrestled there quite often, yeah? Oh, yes. Uh, Championship Wrestling from Hollywood is uh, probably what I would say my home as a wrestler. It, it's, so how long have you been wrestling at uh, Championship Wrestling from Hollywood? I started wrestling there in 2015. Um, my trainer, Drew Gulak, uh, brought me there and introduced me to David Marquez and his crew. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, what impressed me most about Championship Wrestling from Hollywood is, like, obviously I've seen it on TV over the years, but working there, the atmosphere, the environment, it's super professional. It's like, mm. in a lot of ways, it's like a miniature WWE, the way they run the production and, and the camera switches and everything. Like, uh, would you say that... Championship Wrestling from Hollywood is probably the most, I guess, professional independent you wrestle for? Yes, I think so. Um, I like to think of Championship Wrestling from Hollywood as the tortoise. Yeah. You know, there's there's the tortoise and the hare. And uh, the tortoise makes slow steps, but they are steps. There's always progress. Um, Championship Wrestling from Hollywood has changed and transformed over the years, but... In the time that I've been there, it's only gotten better. And um, I think it's getting closer and closer to the finish line. Uh, What I mean by that is um, championship wrestling from Hollywood, from top to bottom, is a completely professional environment. Um, And it's just always being refined. And that's something I can really appreciate. How do you find that working championship wrestling Hollywood is compared to just working your standard indie that might not have TV? Well, I think that when I started professional wrestling, um, everything has been filmed. Yeah. But for a while, uh, there, was, there was an era where a lot of independent wrestling happened, and it was not filmed at all. Uh, so it was strictly for the audience that was present in the room. Um, so when I started, we had cameras on us all the time, and we were always taught to work the cameras. The difference about championship wrestling from Hollywood is the camera, that you work the hard camera, um, the audience really only sits on one side. So it's studio wrestling, uh, similar to the new NWA Power Show that yep. uh, debuted recently. Uh, David Marquez had a big hand in creating that. Uh, and David Lagana and Billy Corgan, actually, um, they studied championship wrestling from Hollywood for about two years uh, before they launched that show. So, uh, And David Marquez, you know, he's uh, more than a 30-year veteran in the professional wrestling industry. He's worked for Vince McMahon. Uh, he's worked for um, WCW. He, he worked, obviously, for the NWA, uh, he believed in studio wrestling. So it was my first experience in a studio environment, you know, with bright lights and TV monitors and uh, referees with earpieces in, um, you know, to keep time for us and tell us when the commercial breaks were coming. Um, So it was a bit of an adjustment, but I was used to working the cameras. And um, I, I would say that the only difference really is in an independent ring, I was taught to play to all sides. Sure. Uh, of all four sides. You know, there's, there's people east, west, north, and south. But at Championship Wrestling from Hollywood, um, you only want to run the ropes east to west. Yes, I was going to say that. You yep. don't want to run north to south because that contradicts the hard camera. Right. Uh, and it's hard to, 
you know, to, to visualize the, the concept that the running and the, um, uh, I, I suppose, the evasive maneuvers. Yeah. So you want to move east to west. So there was a bit of an adjustment, but I would say for the most part, I've always been very comfortable in front of a camera. Yeah, and it, it's very obvious. I mean, you've, you've grown to have quite the fan base over the years. And, you know, I want to delve, I want to go real in-depth to your wrestling career, but I guess every career starts from a beginning, right? Your birth oh, yes. and where you come from. So, like, tell me a little bit about your, your upbringing. Where are you from? What's your backstory? Oh, well, I was raised in um, I guess, uh, Victorian, uh, the Victorian era uh, in England. Uh, you know, my father, he, um, he was a very staunch man, mm -hmm. uh, Pappy Cottonbelly, and uh, he was, um, well, he, he, was, uh, he was a clown. Uh, so my brother Purvis and I, Purvis Rottenbelly, uh, Purvis and I, we always, you know, we, we wanted to perform because we saw our father as a, as a clown, you know, and we thought, well, maybe we could be like that. But he always put us down for it. Oh. You know, he would say, Jeffy boy! How dare you besmirch the good cotton belly name? And I'd say, oh, but Papa, I just want to grapple. Oh, please, I just want to be a wrestler. Jervy boy, you'll do no such thing. You'll be a clown. So I suppose I found a halfway point between wrestling and clowning, and that's where I ended up. Now, as far as my training goes, when I left England, you know, I, I snuck away with the carnival. Uh, that's how Purvis and I got out of, you know, we, we were raised in a big castle. Um, but we decided to give up our, our old ways and we ran away with the carnival. Um, eventually, you know, hanging out with carny folk, um, I ended up at Chikara. So that's kind of where, uh, where things went. Okay. Um, and, and then that, that's where my training really took off when I started training under Mike Quackenbush. Gotcha. And so when you say that you used to talk to your dad about you know, the idea that you, you wanted to grapple, you mm -hmm. wanted to be a wrestler. You knew right away you wanted to be a professional wrestler. Yes. So, like, what was your first exposure to professional wrestling? Well, I would say my first exposure, my first true exposure was uh, watching it, uh, you know, live and in person um, because I had an uncle who liked wrestling very much, Uncle Tony. Okay. And Uncle Tony would bring me to wrestling, um, and, you know, he would teach me about uh, all the heroes, uh, but I would say that my first real love affair with professional wrestling began uh, during the Ultimate Warrior and Hulk Hogan uh, days of, you know, their feud. But you know what else got me into wrestling? What's that? The Hasbro action figures. Oh, the Hasbros are my favorite. We yes. were talking about that before we started recording. Yes, we were. And, and I, I had the ring uh, that had the table built on the side yep. and, and, you know, the stickers. And I really enjoyed that. And um, I would say that... Uh, Collecting the LJN figures and the Hasbro figures, it made it so that when I wasn't watching wrestling, I could think about it and, and you know, uh, imagine it in my head. Yeah, you, so you got lost in the larger-than-life characters, and I can, I can relate to that myself. For me, now, my upbringing wasn't the best. Mm. I've talked about it in various podcasts and on this podcast, too, and it, there was a lot of ups and downs, basically— professional wrestling for me when the bad things were happening in my life like my mom doing drugs or mm. us getting evicted or my dad saying and doing some pretty abusive stuff like oh. i had these larger than life figures to get lost into since for you what was it that compelled you to these larger than life figures like what was your upbringing like well um it's it's funny that you mentioned that or well, maybe not funny but it's coincidental yeah um i i, I had a very a memory that sticks out to me is when I was about 11 years old, uh, my father brought me to a, a wrestling match, and uh, we were sitting in the seats, and, and he had purchased me a Triple H shirt, and um, it said, "Time, it's time to play the game. Yep. Or, no, no, it said, I am the game because I am that... Uh, Damn. D word. Oh, oh I said, oh! I'm, so, I'm sorry. Oh! I apologize. Oh, I think I'm going to faint. <laughs> oh. um, he said, I am that uh, darn good. Anyway, I, I wore that shirt, and after he bought me that shirt, uh, he disappeared, mm. and he left me in the seats by myself. Um, now, at the time, you know, mobile phones weren't really a thing, so I, I was told to stay in the seat, and I sat there by myself for the entire show. Uh, and as it turns out, my father went to um, a bar at the arena, uh, and he got drunk, and he watched a hockey game. Uh, at, at the arena that we were at watching wrestling. So, so I sat and I watched it by myself in my Triple H shirt. And I remember thinking that even though 
my father who brought me to this event, you know, he, uh, he did just enough. And then he left me in the care of my heroes. Yeah. And I was wearing a blanket of security in that Triple H shirt. And even though he was a villain at the time, um, I was still able to find comfort uh, in, in the larger-than-life character that he created because it gave me something to think about uh, instead of thinking about the pain that I was feeling at, at the neglect uh, yeah. from my father. Yeah, man, uh, I, I can relate to that so much. It's like uh, with my mom, like when she... So she had these periods of time where, you know, especially during the night. So there was, there was this period of time where my mom and dad had divorced or they were in the process of being divorced and my mom had sort of brainwashed uh, me and my brother into thinking that she was the good guy and my dad was the bad guy. And my dad was no saint, but in comparison to what my mom was doing, he was a pretty good guy and we should probably have been in his care. But she would have these uh, situations where she would she would run away for a period of, you know, the whole night and wouldn't mm-hmm. come back until like the next afternoon or something. So a lot of the times, not only were we cooking food for ourselves and, and stuff, it was just you know, me and my brother on our own. And mm. there were so many times where, because we didn't have cable, I had just like a few select VHS tapes of like mm-hmm. WWF pay-per-views or WCW pay-per-views. And it's like, for me, um, it was sort of my comfort. It was like sort of my my babysitter in a lot of mm-hmm. ways. So like yes. I grew up like like with father figures and heroes like yes. Hulk Hogan and like Roddy Piper. Like when Roddy Piper passed away a few years ago, oh. there was almost an opportunity where I got to work with him in 2014 or 2015. And when he passed um, because of the WWE tribute videos, which are so incredibly produced, like I just, I started bawling and Mm. my girlfriend that I was with at the time, like looked at me like I was a psychopath and she's like, why are you crying over this man? Like you've never met him once. And I was like, but I feel like he's such a part of my life. There's no way that she could understand. Yeah. Um, Yes. I I feel that too. uh, That sort of this bond or this connection to people you've never really met. Yeah. Um, People that, that, you know, you've only seen, it's a one way communication. Um, I I can relate to that. uh, The idea of, uh, you know, my father would would they would have he would have big nasty fights with my mother, and then he would take off and and his tires would screech out the driveway and he he wouldn't come home uh, sometimes until the next day, uh, sometimes in the middle of the night. But usually I would wait and I'd look out the window for him uh, to get home. Um, but during those times, that's when I was able to bring out my Jack's wrestling figures, uh, and I had my VHS tapes. Now, did did you realize that to an extent? as a fan or do you feel like you started to realize that more once you started your wrestling training? Because I feel like I looked at wrestling a certain way and there were things that I, I understood at like a higher level than maybe your average fan would. But then once I became a wrestler, everything I'd ever seen, everything I ever heard when I would see it or hear it, it was like I was hearing it for the first time because Mm -hmm. I was, I was looking at it in a different way. Yes. You know, I've actually always thought that there's this moment when you, uh, when you go into wrestling training and you cross over this line, uh, you go from being a fan, uh, you go to a consumer of professional wrestling, to being a creator of professional wrestling. Once you put those creator goggles on, you know, you see through that creator's lens, it's hard to take it off. Um, I would assume that if you're into filmmaking, when you watch something like The Avengers, you know, you can see where maybe the CGI isn't as sharp. Or you can see that, uh, you know, a stunt was done using wires instead of uh, free form. You know, and you could see the nuts and the bolts of the creation. Uh, and, and even though, as a filmmaker, it may be fun to examine that, um, you do lose the ability so- in some ways to uh, lose yourself in the project or in, in what you're viewing. So as a wrestler, I always knew that there was a story being told. Uh, I understood, you know, that... Uh, wrestlers in a way were working together but I also found it very well once I became a wrestler I couldn't unsee the process of creating the match you know oh he hit him really hard there oh they messed that one up yeah oh look they slipped and oh I think they're having a miscommunication you know Um, I I stopped seeing it the way I used to see it as a fan now I can only see it in one way and that is as a maker of wrestling so you never, you, you don't feel like you get to have those moments anymore where you, you're still able to kind of get lost and immersed in a match? Now, you see, 
every once in a while I do. Yeah. And that's how I can tell who my favorite wrestlers are. So can I, uh, I can tell you that over the last year, um, now I've, I've seen a lot of wrestling, uh, a lot of wrestling live and in person over the last couple of years. Um, I still get very immersed in uh, Ray Phoenix. Yeah. I, I watch him and I am just in shock at what he can do. Uh, Tessa Blanchard, you know, a, a lot of the time when I watch Tessa, I wonder if she really hates the person that she's working against. Yeah. Uh, because the way that she hits and the, the faces that she makes and the way that she performs, I'm never quite sure if it's real. Sure. Eddie Kingston. Eddie Kingston's incredible. He's, he's a perfect example of yeah. this. Uh, Eddie Kingston, you know, my mom used to come to the shows and she thought Eddie was cute. <laughs> okay. And, 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 she, and Eddie never let me leave that one down. Uh, but uh, my mom would say, well, I think everybody else is... They all get along, but I think that man in the yellow, I don't think he, I think he's serious, isn't he? He's, yeah. he's being real. He's really hurting people in there, isn't he? Yeah. And you know, just that little bit of, is he really hurting people? And, I, and, I, and I think that's the, the... I still do get lost in it, I should, I should say. Just y- yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I think that's the magic that we have as performers. Like, that's that little bit of magic that we still have. It's like, if you can create those moments where people look at everything else on the show and they go, I don't know about all that, but that right there, mm. that was real. You know, like, I think, like, that's a powerful thing that, like... And, and I guess for casual fans in general, like, I'm sure you've had this interaction before. Like, they're... The people that just disregard wrestling as fake, like, or, you know, they, they, they go into these rantings about, like, why it's fake and why mm. it's dumb and why they don't watch it. But even casual fans who don't understand wrestling, they still stop and have those moments like, yeah, yeah all that stuff's phony. But, you know, when you get hit with a chair, mm. like, uh, is that a real chair? Yeah. They, like, they, they, they have you ever heard of a fake chair? Yeah, yeah they, they have, like, more questions than answers right. after they go into these rantings about, well, those like. Those ladders, they're, they're really just made out of balsa wood, aren't they? Yeah, no. yeah, yeah, right. No, right. they're real ladders. Yeah, it, it's like if if only like someone who just dismissed wrestling as fake knew all that comes along with it. Because I, I tried to explain to someone recently, it's like, you know, when I go to the go to the ring, like not only am I memorizing a good portion of a match that might be 8, 10, 12, mm-hmm. 15 minutes long, but, and I don't even really think about these things anymore until I'm in there, but it's like, I need to know where the cameras are, like we mm-hmm. talked about earlier. I need to know that like, you know, I'm listening to the fans for the crowd reaction. So, like, if I need to change something on the fly, I can. You know, I don't have to be married to what I called. Like, you have to be able to listen to the crowd and respond. Uh, you have to remember to do your poses and, like, you know, speak out and everything as That's you're right. moving. Positioning and timing is so incredibly important. And I feel like most younger guys, like, lose sight of how important that is. They're very focused on how many moves they do and not, like, when they do them, mm. why they do them, right. and, like, like the timing and positioning of them. There's so many things that go into the art of wrestling. And Orange Cassidy and I, we actually used to be on an improv team together. Uh, so, okay. So we studied improvisational comedy together. Um, and I think that, you know, the it was, I think it was about 12 weeks. The 12 weeks we spent on that improvisational team helped us uh, to mold what we did in the ring. How'd that come about? That was actually an idea uh, from Mike Quackenbush. Okay. Um, we were going to uh, do a, a sort of like a cage match with the Upright Citizens Brigade of New York City. Uh, we were going to have an improv battle uh, between their people and, and, and the Chikara uh, grapplers. Um, and we never actually got to the point of doing the battle, but we performed plenty of times with the Upright Citizens Brigade. Um, so I would say that Orange Cassidy and I we were able to cut our teeth in the improvisational game there. But I always teach my students uh, here in Los Angeles about yes and. Uh, That's a big rule in improv comedy, um, which, you know, if I say to you, Greg, your hair's on fire. Oh, God. You say, yes. You say, yes. And, oh, it hurts. Oh, my goodness. Or if you don't want to react that way, you say, yes. And I'm impervious to fire. And then you can keep a straight face, you know. But sure. the point is that you take what someone is giving you, a moment or a, an idea or a thought, and then you say yes and you move on with it and, and you build with it. You build up. Um, and I think that those moments that you see in professional wrestling, like The Rock and Hogan, for example, at WrestleMania X8. Classic. Classic example of, of two wrestlers who, you know, you can see that they realize they're getting a moment that they didn't expect that they would have. And they ran with it. You know, they let the audience do their thing. They were both patient, and they both went with the moment. But but most of what I remember are the moments from that match. You know, The Rock 
when he when he looked at the crowd a little cockeyed and he 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 was sort of like are you really booing me yeah after all this time mm -hmm. i'm the people's champ are you booing me are you saying that he's the people's champ yeah and and you know those moments i think were very important uh, at least in my development as a professional wrestler because i don't always know when they're going to happen and i don't know how to plan them but i know when they are happening and i know when to let them happen Sure. Okay. So you mentioned your development as a professional wrestler. So we talked about, you know, your first experiences watching wrestling. Uh, you know, we didn't really touch too much about it. You know, your dad didn't seem like the most supportive guy when it came to your desire to be a professional wrestler. But your mom, you said she came to came to some shows later mm -hmm. on. So your mom was pretty supportive about everything. That's right. And um, well, my dad actually came with her too uh, when you know when, when he was still around. Um, so so the two of them would come together. Uh, but my mom actually she really helped me further my love for wrestling. I'll never forget when she came home uh, with the uh, the whole set of ECW action figures. Oh, okay. It was the first time that ECW was able to make action figures, and I was very excited. Um, and she came home with the whole set for me. And, and I just remember I knew in that moment that, that um, I was very grateful to have her as my mother um, because she knew what I loved, and she lifted it. You know, she lifted my love up. She... she uh, she put wind behind the sails of, of my passions. Yeah. And she also took me to meet The Rock. Um, really? That's right. And uh, we were at the shopping mall in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. What year is this? Oh, I guess, well, my goodness. I would say this might have been the year 2000. Okay. Um, and, and she didn't know, you know, she just thought, oh, we're going to meet a wrestler, no big deal. But then when she saw The Rock, she said, oh, oh, dear Jervy, he is electrified. <laughs> it's funny that your mom, like very, two very different ends of the spectrum. She mm. both fell in love with The Rock and then also Eddie Kingston. Well, you know, they are both very <laughs> captivating, electrifying performers, but in different ways. Very different ways. That's that's funny. So obviously we've talked a lot about the wrestling action figures. Now, did your love for toys go to any other areas besides professional wrestling? Oh, yes. I'm a big toy collector. Um, I mostly collect at the 112 scale. Okay. Uh, but I have some larger... Uh, figures and some smaller ones. Um, it, mostly, I like to collect uh, toys that inspire me. Okay. Um, maybe artistically, or whether it's a character that I, I enjoy. Um, but I would say that my toy collecting hobby has it's coincided with my wrestling hobby because you know when you go perform in, uh, let's say Texas. You know, I go to Austin, Texas to perform, and I can go to a bunch of new Walgreens and Targets and Walmarts, and I can look for the toys, you know, and I can hunt. Uh, that's what collectors do. Um, or I can even go to vintage shops, yeah. you know, or old toy shops. I, I went to a really great one uh, the last time I was staying in Ohio, um, so, or rather Indianapolis. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that my toy collecting hobby, it's very natural uh, sort of progression, wrestling toys into other toys and other collectibles. Um, but I think that the two universes are very closely joined. I don't disagree with that at all. Now, when you talk about the artist in you, you know, let's go back to the development of you as a professional wrestler. So you, you, you run away to become a fr professional wrestler. Mm -hmm. Do you already have this idea that you're be become this mask performer? Like, what's no. the story behind the mask? Because I've seen you without your mask, and you're a very handsome man. Oh. It's it, it's it's very. Ah. It, it was always very strange to me that you would hide that face under a mask. Well, that's very sweet of you to say. I um, speak the truth. Well, I, I um I would say that the I, the, the mask uh, well, it was given to me by my trainer, and and it was sort of like a test run. Uh, I was always. Uh, when I was I was called um, I, I I was called the kid with the good look. Uh, that's what that's what they used to say when I, I started training, and the mask was given to me to protect me. And they said you're going to wear this, and if you stink, no one will know. So if you can't work and if you you can't wrestle, you'll just wear this and you'll be bad at it, and that'll be that. Uh, and eventually you'll get better, and then someday you can perform without a mask. Um, but what ended up happening is that uh, I, I don't know how to say this on a podcast or how to illustrate this, but I felt like my whole life I had been wearing a mask. My face, my body, uh, the clothes I wear, you know, to school or to work, I, 
all those things and I, I styled myself in such a way that, you know, this is what society wants. This is what my friends expect of me. This is what my family wants me to look like. Um, this is how, you know, someone my age is supposed to dress or supposed to speak or act. You know, and I, I, I always felt like I wasn't really being my truest self. But when I put this mask on for the first time, I felt like I had just ripped my chest open and this, 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 sh this skin of insecurity and vanity and um, just, you know, just sort of external valid I, uh, someone who needed external validation. I was able to rip all of that off and the true me was able to come out. How much of, you said, you know, you feel like you once you put on that mask. So like how much of, of the character do you feel is, is a character and how much it is really you? I mean, or is, do you feel that that term, um, you know, my wrestling character is me amped up. Do you think that applies to you or do you feel like this is just, this is the best version of yourself? I don't know if that makes sense. Yes. I know exactly what you're, what you're asking. I would say that this character is the person I've always wanted to be. Uh, it's the idealized version of myself. When I'm living my day-to-day -day life, and you know, you're not allowed to wear masks into banks, uh, you're not really encouraged to wear a mask to a place like Disneyland or um, you know, to Starbucks in the morning. Sure. I think it would freak a lot of people out. Maybe. So I don't. Uh, I don't wear my mask there. But um, when I put this mask on, it's like I have a superpower. I have super patience. I have super kindness. I, I, I'm able to listen with great empathy. Sometimes when I'm not wearing this mask, I forget myself. Um, I, I can be mean. I can be surly. I can, I can be uh, short-sighted. Um, I can be a less than ideal version of myself. But when I wear, wear this mask, and, and I have to, you know, I have to, to project this image. What is actually happening in here is I'm not projecting something fake. I'm taking the realest part of me and, the, the per, again, the person I aspire to be, and I'm putting that out in the universe. And, um, and I would say that, that, you know, I've always wanted to be the kind of person that doesn't have any enemies. I've always wanted to be liked by everyone. You know, I, I don't want anyone to have, have a reason to frown at me. Um, when I don't wear my mask, I think that I tend to behave in a way that does make people frown at me sometimes. And, it, you know, I do let people down. But when I'm in this mask and I, I have this character about me, I'm allowed to be uh, the person I've always wanted to be, and I get to shed the expectations, the external expectations that society has put on me. You know, if you, oh, well, you're a, you're a handsome man at the age of this and that, and your skin color is that, and your income is this, you know, you have to act this way. But when I wear this mask, no one tells me how to act. It comes from within, and I, I get to dictate how I behave. And the truth is, if I could control my actions all the time, and if I was in complete control of who I am, I would just be nice all the time to everyone. Um, so this mask, I would say, gives me great control, uh, and it allows me to, again, be the truest form of myself that I could possibly be. It, that's... It's hard for me to imagine you as anything other than sweet and kind and gentle. And but I I do know it's great that you brought that up from a lot of your social media posts that you're a very big advocate of mental health. And it, obviously, as you just kind of alluded to, you've been through some struggles in that field. And I do want to talk about some of your triumphs as a professional wrestler because sure. I think that's a an incredible part of your story. And obviously, it shows that you've you've been overcoming these obstacles with mental health, but where do you think exactly th these feelings stem from? Like, was it something that as far back as you can remember, you can remember dealing with these issues mentally? Do you think it's something like with your upbringing or uh, what, what do you think it comes from? It, it is a mixture, um, definitely a mixture of things. Uh, I just thought about today that um, I, I got called a lot of names as, as, a, as a child by both my parents. Um, not really terrible names, but you know, foul words and, and, and things, things that I didn't think I was. Um, my father used to always say that I was um, 
effed up. Uh, and, and, and he, you know, eventually I believed that. Yeah. Um, and that's what I mean by the external expectations and ideas that th the outside world puts on you. You know, sometimes uh, you wear them, you wear those things like a piece of armor. And, and through my upbringing, though it wasn't entirely traumatic, you know, to, <laughs> this, is, this is where it's very, it's, it's hard to explain, but no one outside my family knew about the abuse that went on in my family. Every, even my grandparents uh, didn't know how my father treated my mother and my brother and myself. Um, and we were taught to wear masks. We had to go to school and pretend that we were happy all the time. You know, if the teachers asked us, well, you know, I, I see that you've been struggling in school. How was your home life? You know, I had to pretend it was okay because I didn't want to embarrass my parents. Um, when I would stay at my friends' houses, you know, and I would see... Well, well, why does, uh, you know, why does Zach's mom kiss him goodnight and say, I love you? Why doesn't my mom do that? Uh, why doesn't my father do that? Why does, why does Zach's father put him to bed, but my father falls asleep on the floor or on the couch? Um, you know, I, I started to learn that what was normal for me wasn't normal for everyone else. And not only that, but I wasn't allowed to tell anyone. And I had to keep those secrets. And I had to wear a mask. My whole life I've been wearing a mask. So when I put this on, like I said, I feel like I ripped my chest open like Clark Kent and, and Superman came out, you know, and, and that's the real me. I'm not Clark Kent, you know. Clark Kent is, is the mask. Sure. Superman is, is who he really is. That's Kal-El. That's, that's who, who is, is the truest form of, of, of the hero. And that's what this, that's what Jervis is for me. Yeah. Um, this is my Superman, you know, and... This is my chance to embrace who I really am. Uh, and, and I'll tell you this, from sharing about my mental health struggles, a lot of people ask if that sets me back or if it gives others the wrong idea about me as a performer. Um, but the truth is, I don't want to hide anymore. I don't want society to look at me and think everything is okay. I want them to know that I'm struggling because I think a lot of the people that are watching me, I think they have struggles too. For sure. I think everyone has struggles. and. I think if I put them on display, and I talk about my struggle, but I also show that, well, you know, I did make it to work today, and I did brush my teeth, and I combed my hair, and I put on my clothes, and I got out of the house. If I can do that, so can you. You know, and I want people to, to watch me, or who watch me, to know um, that they can overcome the same things that I've overcome, um, because we're all in this together. Um, so that's sort of where my... I, I guess being a champion of mental health came from is I had to hide it for so long and I had to, to pretend I was okay for so long and I just got sick of it yeah. and I don't want to pretend I'm okay anymore. I just want to be me and, and, and I want to be okay with that. Yeah, and you know what? I get that 100% because it, it's amazing how similar our upbringings were because I felt the same way as a kid. Like, you know, even though my mom was doing drugs and my dad was drinking and they were both sort of abusive in their own ways, I felt like no one outside of my immediate family, the people in that house, me, my brothers, and, and my mom and dad knew what was going on, right? And there were these moments where um, I love my dad. Um, he's always there for me. And, uh, and I know he regrets these things now. And I know it's hard for him to address these issues. But as far as my mental health goes, like it's something that sticks out to me. You talked about how, how you were called names and stuff. Like I'll never forget... Um, as a kid, and I don't know where this stemmed from with my dad. Maybe he thought it was in jest or whatever, but like, it's something that has stand out, stood out to me to this day. Um, on a regular basis, my dad used to call me a gimp oh, and a cripple. I'm sorry. And and make fun of my disability, right? That's so rotten. And at the same time, um, I'll never forget. Obviously, those things bothered me, but I like I pushed it down and whatever. And actually. My coping mechanism was, I, you know, self-deprecation. I would make fun of things mm. before anyone else could. Like I would make fun of my own disability or my 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 terrible clothes, my hand-me-downs, my Kmart jeans and T-shirt. I would make fun of that stuff so no one else could. That was my way of dealing. But I'll never forget. My mom knew that I was hurt by the things that my dad said to me, and so one time. My parents got into a domestic altercation. Mm. Cops were called, which was a very regular thing. And I'll never forget sitting on the steps, 
the cops were contemplating uh, taking my dad to jail. Usually they just took him around the block and then they brought him home after he calmed down and everything was fine. It was as if nothing ever happened. I'll never forget my mom exploiting the way that I felt um, Hmm. getting called those names by telling the officers, um, tell tell the officer what your dad calls you. And I remember like feeling that lump in my throat because I knew where she was going with it. She put you in the middle. She put me in the middle of it and I... I just started bawling. I said, he calls me a gimp, like crying in front of these officers. Mm. And like, they kicked my dad and they put him in the police car. And mm. then he, he went off to, to prison. But then you feel responsible. And I felt like responsible mm. for that. Right. So like, that's something that like, it's terrible. Um, on top of everything. So like, not only did I make fun of the thing, so I didn't have to hear it from other people. I would make fun of myself, but like, I would have these moments, these conscious moments over the years as a kid and you know when I've gone through hardships uh, as I've become an adult like where I thought I was worthless Mm. and I didn't want to live anymore you know what I mean and that's something that like it's it's hard to admit but I feel like as you were saying I don't want to hide my struggles I don't want to hide who I am and what I've been through and I feel like my biggest successes as a wrestler haven't come in the ring it's through being able being strong enough to share my story mm. and know that there's other people out there that have gone through similar things, so now they know that they're not alone. Yes, I think that's very important, and I appreciate you sharing that story with me. Yeah. Uh, I know that that's got to be very difficult to talk about. It is. It's. It, it sounds, I can see it so clearly in my mind, um, you know, that, that, that interaction happening between, you know, your mother, the police, your father, and you. Um, in, in, it's It's really a shame that, you had to carry so much weight from all sides as, as a youngster. And I think that your message, you know, I, I was first introduced to you in 2012 uh, at Chikara. As, you know, you were the handicapped hero. Yeah. And I, I think that uh, just that alone, uh, you know, gimps or cripples, and I'm using air quotes here because yeah. I never use words like that. But sure. uh, when I was growing up, those were things that weren't championed. You weren't looked at someone of, uh, you know, you weren't looked at, at, at uh, usually the disabled person in a comic book was someone who was, they were a villain. You know, they were an outcast from society, the hunchback of Notre Dame, the, the phantom of the opera. You know, they were the cast outs. But uh, someone like you, Greg, you are uh, the handicapped hero. And I think that that story is something that needs to be told. It's very important. Uh, a dear friend of mine has muscular dystrophy, um, and he plays hockey. He plays sled hockey. And, um, you know, he grew up idolizing ice hockey players. And when he got sled hockey and when he was able to play sled hockey, he started to idolize sled hockey players. And he would tell me all about them. He had the trading cards, and we would, you know, I would trade him my cards, and he would have the sled hockey cards. And, and, and he had positive role models to look up to. You know, and I think that you provide, you, you give that to youngsters out there who may want to wrestle, uh, but may not have the physical capabilities of, um, you know, someone else who, who may be at 100% full health. Um, and I think that uh, it's important for, for you to do that. It's important for me to do that because even though physically I appear okay and I don't have any, you know, uh, you don't see my mental illness on me, you know, I don't, I don't have a tattoo. I don't really wear it. Um, if I speak about it and then people can see that I can perform and I can lose myself in my creation or I can uh, have a moment or, or I can experience something special, I think that maybe there's hope for them too. Um, so I think that both of our stories, it seems like they revolve around hope. 100%. And I, I find your story incredibly inspiring. And one, one thing I wanted to talk about you know, as far as mental health too, it's like, you know, obviously you're very open about your situation. And I think this will be very important for anyone listening. When did you realize consciously that it's okay to be open and it's okay to, I guess, ask for help? Like when, when did you realize that that's okay? And how have you dealt with it over the years? Well, the interesting thing about being raised in a broken home or a broken family system is that the only way the broken family system can stay whole is if everyone is broken. 
I was what they would call the identified patient. Uh, so anyone who's been to therapy would know, or especially family therapy, would know this term. Um, the identified patient is the person in a broken system who stands up and says, hey, I'm not okay. I need help. When I did that, I became the outcast of my family. Um, I was, I suppose I was 15 years old, and uh, I had gone to school the day after Halloween, and um, over the loudspeaker in school, our principal uh, announced that my neighbor and my best friend had killed himself the night before. And that was how I found out, was, was over the loudspeaker. And, and, you know, we heard screams and cries all over the school because none of us had ever dealt with death, uh, really, you know, aside from perhaps someone's grandparents or, or, you know, older relatives. But this was someone like us. And not only did he die, but he killed himself in a very gruesome manner. And ever since that day, uh, the idea of suicide has been something that's plagued me um, and it's followed me around, uh, sort of as like a... Um, an eject button or an escape hatch. You know, if you see a pilot at war and they have to get out of the plane and parachute to the ground. Uh, but it, it's like that, but without a parachute. Um, and that's when I was able to finally say, hey, I'm not doing all right. I need help. Because I keep thinking about these grisly visions of death and my own death, and I don't know why. And I couldn't shape the thoughts. So my mom, she was the one who... She took me to the doctor. We had a, my mom and I used to butt heads. Same as my father and I, same as my brother and I. All of us collectively were like oppositely charged uh, magnets. You know, we repelled each other. But when my mom knew I was really hurting on a deeper level, she took me to get help uh, from a psychologist. And in my talk therapy, um, what ended up happening was uh, resentment between my father and I grew while my mother and I grew closer because she knew that I was really trying to just get help and get better. But my father would, he thought of it as, oh, well, you know, uh, Jervie's going to therapy and he's saying bad things about me all the time. And, well, I can't tell him what I really think because he's all effed up. And that's how it always went was, ooh, ooh I have to tiptoe around you. I can't tell you how I feel because you're effed up. And, and that was worse than him just being mean to me and saying what he felt. I'd rather have him been drunk and yelling and breaking things. Sure. Um, you know, but he, he instead made it about how weak I was. Um, in fact, I, what I see now is, and to anyone out there listening who, you know, maybe you're in a broken system right now, uh, if you stand up and you say, I need help and I can't be in this broken system anymore, um, you're not weak, you're strong. That takes a lot of strength and a lot of bravery to go against uh, the, your blood to go against the people who raise you and care for you. Um, so that's what I had to do. And eventually my mom and my brother came around, uh, but it took almost 10 years. Um, I spent, spent a long time as, as an outcast in my own family. Uh, and eventually it, I had to stop you know, going to family holidays and, and family dinners. And that's when my family really broke apart because I was no longer there as, you know, we, we were like a four square, all four of us, square. But once I left, there was an open angle on the end there, and uh, that's where things started to fall apart. So I spent a lot of time being an outcast in my own family, and that's also why when I look at the people who, you know, they tweet me, right? There are lots of people who tweet me and watch uh, my videos that um, have never actually seen me in person or met me, but in a lot of ways I feel like we're all part of a big family, uh, and we all connect because even though they may be outcasts, you know, by their own blood, um, we connect over a, a shared bond of professional wrestling uh, or a performance. So I think that I would say that that's where, for me, all of the, the awareness of my own mental health started with my best friend's suicide. Um, and since that time, I've, you know, if you went to my, my birthday when I was 10 years old, uh, nine out of 10 friends that were at that party are now gone, um, whether it's through uh, opioid addiction or suicide, uh, one or the other, so drugs or, uh, you know, by their own hand. Um, so I, as I take care of my own mental health and as I continue to, you know, I, I have downfalls, I trip and fall and then I stand back up, I want people to know 
I don't want it to be a surprise that I'm struggling. I want them to know that, hey, I fell down and someone helped me back up. Or this time I had to get back up on my own. Um, I just want people to know. That's it. I, I want to set an example, good, bad, or ugly. I want them to know my story. Uh, I feel that if I leave anything behind in this world, I want it to be my story, and I want it to be an example for others who may be in a similar place, because uh, you're not alone. You know, none of us are alone. And, and yeah. often, especially when dealing with mental illness, you can feel so very lonely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when Now, when you talk about, you know, you alluded that you went to therapy a little bit. What about... Have you ever taken medication? And, and uh, I guess on top of that, my question is, um, what do you say to someone that's afraid to seek help? What would you tell them? Well, uh, as far as medication goes, I have been on Ritalin, Adderall, Vivant, Paxil, Wellbutrin, Prozac, Concerta, Mm, what else now? There's a couple more in there. Uh, that in itself is a lot. Latuda. Okay. Lamictal. Jesus. Um, Seroquel. Oh, gosh. I think that's about it. But uh, over the last 15 years, I've been on many antipsychotics, SSRIs, um, no benzodiazepines. Uh, I, I've, but I've had a lot of different medications in my system. Uh, and the best I've ever felt... Uh, is when I'm not self-medicating. Uh, that tends to be something that a lot of people with mental health troubles do. You know, perhaps a friend will hand you a cannabis cigarette or maybe a beer or something, and you think, well, this makes me feel better today, so I'll just have that. Um, but it's not a long-term solution. Right. Um, medication, I think, it's not for everyone, I think talk therapy can be perfect medication for most, uh, or for some. But for those of you who are afraid to seek out help, medicine is not a horrible thing. You just have to be very diligent with your doctors. You have to stay on top of them uh, because they have lots of patients. You have to be a master of your own medication. You have to know exactly how it makes you feel and uh, whether or not you need more, less, or none at all. Um, I've gone through many struggles with medication, um, I'd like to touch on some in a bit, but as far as people who are afraid to seek help, I want you to know that there are resources for you available. Uh, in most states in America, um, there are ways to find, uh, there's, there's access to mental health rehabilitation and uh, to cheap medication uh, and to, to therapy uh, that's publicly available. It's really a matter of taking the leap and I think that some people are afraid to admit that perhaps they're facing an issue and, and maybe if, if I go and get help, that means I'm weak. Um, just last Friday, uh, I checked myself into the emergency room. And really? uh, it, it's been, so back to the point of medication, uh, this past July, 2019, uh, my psychiatrist did not refill my prescription for Lamictal which is a mood stabilizer. Uh, it's typically used for people that, that are epileptic and bipolar. Okay. Um, now, I'm, I've been classified as bipolar, but I've also been classified as borderline personality disorder. They're very similar, but the mood stabilizer works roughly the same. When I lost access to this mood stabilizer, uh, in about two days, uh, after almost a year of no sort of outbursts, no emotional, no panic attacks, no rage outbursts, no suicidal tendencies or planning or ideation. Within about two days from me not taking my mood booster, I became suicidal overnight. Mm. And it's hard to explain because people say, well, no, you just, just don't kill yourself. It's easy. If you don't want to, don't do it. Right. But, you know, when you spend all day and all you can see is your own demise and you can't shake the thought when, when that becomes your reality, it can be very scary. Yeah. Now, last Friday, I thought, if I go to the hospital today, that will be the third time in three years. I've had a stay at a psychiatric hospital in 2017, again in 2018, and here I am, right at the last quarter of 2019, and I'm ready to check myself into the hospital again. And I, I was crying, and I, I thought, I, I said it to my mom, I said, 
well, what does that make me? If I go to the hospital today, what does that make me? What does society see me as? And she said, it doesn't matter. She said, as long as you get better, that's the only thing that matters. She said, don't worry about what society sees you as. Just worry about how you see you. And she said, you're doing a very brave thing. And you're being very strong. And that really sat with me as I didn't think I was being brave. I thought I was being weak. Even as I sit here and I tell you that it's a brave thing to stand up and fight for your, for your health. Um, just last week, I felt weak. I felt, I felt, uh, I, I said, I'm not a man. I said, I'm not a man. I'm not a real man because I'm not able to handle my problems on my own. But do you know who wasn't a real man? Who's that? It was my father. Because he never sought help. He never thought he needed it. He was severely mentally ill. Um, he chose to self-medicate. Uh, and uh, you know, over the years, drinking alcohol ruined his life. And he would act as if the measure of a man was by how little help he needed. I think the measure of a man is by how self-aware and how truthful and honest they can be. Or, or a woman. The measure of a person is how honest are you with yourself, about yourself? I don't hide from who I am, and I, I don't run from it. I run to it. I try to run through it. Um, it's not always easy, and I think that the road is, is that I travel is a lot rockier than most, but this is the only road I have. What, what keeps you going then? Like, like you have that moment last Friday where you think, I'm not a man. I want to go to the hospital. You don't even have the medication that you need. What keeps you going? Well, I would say what kept me going uh, last week, it's, it's my support system. It's, um, it's my, my girlfriend and my mom and my brother and my, my best friends, my brother, uh, um, you know, Purvis and, and, and loud and noxious and uh, my cat, Archduke Alfred, and my dog, Lord Boopelsnoot. Uh, all the people in my life that I love and that I lean on when, I, when I'm feeling down, I feel that it's my responsibility to them to take care of myself. Yeah. And more than that, and this is, um, you know, I often fear the day when I don't wrestle anymore because uh, going, it, 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 it may sound silly, but but my, the people that follow me on social media um, keep me going. You know, I, I think about what would the world look like if, 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 if Jervis gave up and went away and, and, and decided to leave early, you know, leave the party early and do an Irish goodbye. Um, I think I would let a lot of people down. And it might seem like a lot of pressure, but... In my moments of tr my, my true tests, in the moments where I feel that I need the most strength, I think about the people who tweet me and they say, uh, you know, Jervis, you inspired me to go talk to my, th my therapist. Jervis, you inspired me to reach out to my friend who's been struggling. You know, I get those messages every day. And I think if I don't take care of myself, I'm letting them down. And that's why... You know, this started as professional wrestling, but it has transformed into something entirely different. And long after the, the, the ring ropes are taken down and the, the boards are carried away, I'm still going to be here and this message is going to be here and I need to shout it out. Uh, I can't let the people down that believe in me uh, because I believe in them and I need them just as much as they need me. If I'm not here, you know, when I give them love, they reflect it back to me like a mirror. And it just goes back and forth, and it's lovely. It's like a, a, you know, an, an ellipse, or rather a, a, you know, an infinity symbol. It just yep. keeps going. It's love yep. all around, love reciprocated. And um, that's, that's what, what keeps me going, is, is the love that I feel from, from my support system. We've talked so much about this sad stuff and this gloomy stuff. Mm. Juris, I want to talk about your biggest triumphs in the ring. Oh. You know, so like, I mean, you've been doing this for a long time now. You yes. said you started in 2008? Uh, yes. 2008, so uh, over 10 years. 
Mm. That's crazy. Like it for me, it feels like it's yesterday. It's been 13 years. It feels like I started yesterday. I'll never forget the first time I stepped into the ring at the Wild Samoan Training Center. Yeah, tell me about that. Well, believe it or not, actually, my father took me. Okay. Um, I, and and he said to me on the ride, he said, uh, I, I said, you know, I, I really want to do this wrestling thing. I, I think I can do it. Uh, and and at the time, uh, I had never been trained as a wrestler. I'd never been in a ring. But I knew that I had to get my body ready and my mind ready. So I worked out about five or six days a week. Um, and I ate, I ate like a horse. I, I ate eggs and chicken and um, all sorts of protein things. And um, I, I built myself up uh, in such a way that, you know, I thought wrestlers have to be big and strong. I weighed over 220 pounds. Wow. Um, yes, I, I used to bench press 315 pounds. It's very impressive. I was very strong. Yeah. Uh, but n- now I'm nice and sinewy and skinny. I would say I would say you're very cut. Oh. Very you lean. Know. You still have a very Ooh. impressive physique. <laughs> well, um, so I, um, I was with my father, and well, I, I would say this too. I purchased... Every single wrestling autobiography or book that existed. Oh, I was the same way. Every single one. And, and I have a shelf in there. I'm, I'm going to show you in my other room because I read all of them with a highlighter. Okay. And, and I would highlight lessons, things that I thought were important uh, to learn and to take with me. So, you know, I, I, I was, uh, I, I had uh, college courses in, in information technology and uh, I was a web developer. So I did a lot of coding and a lot of stuff like that. But I already was an expert at that. I knew that like the back of my hand. But wrestling, I applied the same type of study to wrestling. So I had read all these books and I highlighted all the notes and the lessons in them. Uh, and then when I went to the Wild Samoan Training Center, uh, they simply asked me to do uh, to run the ropes and then to do a ring a- exit, you know, to, to kind of sort of uh, go through the middle rope and place your palm on the apron and then exit. And I did it flawlessly, swimmingly. Um, and Arthur the Wild Samoan uh, asked me to come back to train. Uh, and then he moved to Florida and uh, never really heard from him again. <laughs> Interesting. Um, but, but for the most part, uh, I'll never forget that first moment in the ring because when I stood there and, you know, I kind of, I gave it a little little press with my feet and I felt it bounce a bit, but I also knew it was hard. You know, I knew it wasn't, this isn't some comfy thing. Um, I felt like... It was like this cosmic moment, you know. It was the stars aligned and and the clouds parted and sunbeams came down from the sky and I felt like this is where I was meant to be. Because we've talked so much about so many other things and we've been going, we've been going over an hour now, buddy. Oh. Well, look at the time just flying it's by. It's flying by, and like I feel My like we goodness. could we could do a part two of this for sure. Maybe we should. Let's talk about if you had to tell someone three matches, mm-hmm. three opponents of yours that they, they should go out of the way to look up, to see Gentleman Jervis in action, what would those matches be? Well, the first one you have to watch is Gentleman Jervis versus Orange Cassidy. Okay. Uh, and you can find that on YouTube. Uh, I believe it's on the Wrestle Circus YouTube channel, but just search Jervis Orange Cassidy and you'll find it. Um, I think that that's a, a nice, succinct version of, uh, well, it just, that's the type of storytelling that I'm doing these days. Um, And Orange Cassidy has just blown up uh, all over America uh, as far as professional wrestling goes. And, you know, he's taken a lot of criticism for his uh, style of professional wrestling. But um, that's a match that I would say, if you want to know who is Gentleman Jervis, that's the match. That's the one that makes makes the most sense. Okay. If you want to see me in a match where... um, I do some more athletic things. Uh, I would say, uh, not more athletic, but if you want to see more of a standard, you know, a wrestler's match, um, search Jervis versus Kevin Martinson. Okay. Now, Kevin Martinson also goes by BHK. Okay. uh, Big Hunky Kev. Yes. He's one half of the Rock Nest Monsters Mm -hmm. with humor. Um, They perform at bar wrestling, championship wrestling from Hollywood. Very talented. Yes, PWG. Um, Now... Uh, Kevin and I had one of just a great match. Well, I, I mean, I thought it was a great match. It was for the television championship at Championship Wrestling from Hollywood. Okay. So I would say to search out Jervis versus Kevin Martinson, Jervis versus Orange Cassidy. Um, and then I'm trying to think of another one that, that may stand. Oh, yes, I've got it. 
Jervis versus Robert Baines in a cage. Oh. Yes, I had my first cage match this year. I can't believe that someone like you would be in such a barbaric match. Oh, it was very brutish. And I'm going to tell you something, Greg, and it might make you faint. So, okay. so prepare yourself. All right. I'm ready. I used a closed fist. No, you didn't. Two of them. I don't believe it. I used all. two closed fists. I've never used two closed fists. What? Get it? Because I have one oh, functioning you. hand. Okay. Oh, you're wicked. <laughs> okay. Oh, you wicked man. But that cage match is on YouTube. It's on YouTube, yes. Jervis versus Robert B-A-I-N-E-S. Cage match. Okay. And and here's something that I wanted to talk about real quick, too. You know, you talked about earlier teaching your students. Mm. Tell me about your uh, teaching. Is, it, is this is this wrestling yes. or is this an improv thing? This like, what's wrestling. the deal? Uh, so I've been teaching for about three years now here in Los Angeles. Uh, some of my students uh, in... Uh, well, well, some of my students have graduated and are now uh, performing all over the world. Uh, they include Brody King, Jake Atlas, Heather Monroe, um, uh, Lucas Riley. Uh, there's, there's lots of them that uh, they've really made names for themselves. Um, but I specialize in character development. And uh, what that means is when, uh, especially at Santino Brothers here in Los Angeles, um, they teach them the, you know, the, the basics, the lucha, uh, and all the different forms of wrestling, but just as the wrestlers that are about to debut and they need that top level polish, you know, they need the the bells and the whistles, if you will. Um, I add those. And I like to tell my students because they always, you know, they come to me and say, well, I'm just not sure who I am in the ring. And I say, don't worry about who you are. Worry about how you want your audience to feel. When you walk through the curtain, What do you want them to feel? Do you want them to feel joy, contempt, pleasure, pain? Uh, Do you want them to feel, do you want them to laugh? Do you want them to cry? Uh, I say focus on one emotion and just really, really nail it. Now for me, when I enter the ring, the one emotion I want to elicit, and it doesn't really even, I don't know if this emotion has a name, but I want people to say, aww. Mm You know, yeah. just like that, because I don't know a wrestler that's ever done that. I've never seen a wrestler make me say, oh, and you do it well. And it, besides Macho Man and Liz, oh, I, I see. That's S- what I mean. Summer that goes back to SummerSlam 91. Could you ever can you imagine in this show. in this day and age? Can you imagine ending a pay-per-view with a with a wedding with no shenanigans? That's what I mean. It was earnest. It was beautiful. It was true. Yeah, because Ma- because. Because Randy really, really loved Elizabeth. It was real, true love. And they got to put their love on display. And, and oh, goodness, when you champion love, when you make love the ultimate emotion, I don't think there's anything better. Oh. And, and I just thought, if I could take the feeling that I had when I saw Macho Man and Liz, if I could take that feeling and turn it into an entire wrestling character, that's what you see here. That's yeah. what Gentleman Jervis is. Where could uh, where could the ladies and gentlemen find you on social media? Please find me on Twitter, Instagram uh, as Gentleman Jervis. That's G E N T L E M A N J E R V I S. Very good. And one last thing, and I feel like you've probably said it in some form, but I ask everybody this: Jervis, what inspires you? Uh, love, love inspires me. It's a beautiful thing. That's all we need is love, right? That's all we need. Jervis, I love you. I love you, Gregory. Thank you. You're welcome. And remember, stick around for the outro. We always have an outro. I don't know if you guys are tuning out when it comes time for the outro, but stick around for that because uh, it's uh, it's going to get pretty deep today. Everyone knows that I love good vintage wrestling merch. But when I want the best of the best, when it comes to finding vintage wrestling memorabilia, I go to the Savage Stash. The Savage Stash is your wheeler and dealer for the best in vintage wrestling shirts, hats, jackets, accessories, and everything in between. I've picked up some of my all-time favorite vintage items from the Savage Stash, and that's including the original Hunter Hearst Helmsley How to Be a Snob Tee from 1995, and I've never seen that anywhere else online. And just last year, I picked up a vintage 1996 WF Royal Rumble tee that I gifted to Johnny Gargano for his birthday. It was in mint condition, and 
I'm telling you, Johnny could not have been happier when he opened that up because I know the Royal Rumble in 96 meant a lot to him with Shawn Michaels winning and everything. I've also got a wide variety of fanny packs from the Savage Dash over the years, including a rare WWF Championship fanny pack from 1991, and of course, their ultra-stylish green and purple three-pocket Savage Dash fanny pack that I use to store all of my goodies when I'm on the road. Right now on SavageDash.com, they're selling exclusive Intercontinental Championship pins with interchangeable white and black straps. You can get black or white strap alone for 10 bucks, the black or the white strap with the plate for $20, or you can get both straps and the plate for just $30. That's right, $30. And if you're buying this pin or any other fanny packs, hats, or vintage merch at TheSavageDash.com, you can use promo code IRON. I-R-O-N, at checkout to save 10% on your order. That's right. It's an exclusive offer to listeners of Iron On Wrestling. If you go to thesavagestash.com and buy any items at all and use the promo code IRON, the Savage Stash will take 10% off your entire order. To see all of their current or past items, go to www.thesavagestash.com, follow them at the Savage Stash on Twitter or Instagram, and like them on Facebook at the Savage Dash. Hey, what are you waiting for? If you're looking for the best in vintage merch, go to the place that can't be topped. Check out the Savage Dash, the absolute cream of the crop. That was the interview with Gentleman Jervis, and usually after these interviews, we like to go to three things that Aaron learned about the interview, but we felt like today was a little bit more of a serious podcast, and obviously we, we got into some really serious issues and situations here and i i really commend jervis on being such an advocate for mental health and he's got a super inspiring story uh and before we delve into what we just listened to real quick i just wanted to give a couple plugs for the podcast because i haven't mentioned anything today you should be following us on social media at iron on wrestling you can find us on facebook twitter instagram (laughs) at fair to air (laughs) f Shut up, I'm coughing. I'm going to edit that out. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, you can follow me on social media at Craig Rowe on Twitter. Oh, you okay, you fucking piece of shit. You can follow me on social media at Gregory Iron on Twitter, at Gregory underscore Iron on Instagram. You can find me on Facebook. Just search Gregory Iron. And you can find me at Fair to Air, F A I R T O A A R on Twitter, and Air Force One, A A R Force, and W O N on the Instagram. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, like I said, so when I sat with down with Jervis, I talked about a lot of serious stuff, as you heard. And, uh, you know, I think we're going to probably talk about it one day on the podcast. Uh, one of the things that really made me connect with you, and I think it was the same with talking with Jervis so in depth for the first time, is uh, when I found out your experiences as a child and the abuse that you went through. And, you know, I, I was a victim of child abuse, and and that probably plays a factor in my mental health today. Like, I know you've had some mental health issues in the past, and, and I think we all experience mental health issues, and, like, we have these moments where we feel like um, <clears throat> we're alone and there's no one to turn to, and, and like things are bleak and they're never gonna get better but you know uh i think i can speak for aaron and myself when we say like you're not you're not alone and things will get better eventually you just got to hang in there and stay positive and just focus on the things that that are good in your life and it sometimes it's hard to it's it's easy to lose sight of the good when there's so much overwhelming bad and uh you know uh if you ever need someone to talk to obviously the first thing you should do is reach out to someone that loves and cares about you. And if you don't feel like you have that situation, there's always the national suicide prevention hotline that you can call, which is 1-800-273-8255. They are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's always someone that's willing to chat with you. And if you don't chat via phone, they will talk to you online. And look, we just gave our social medias out. I'm sure you don't mind me saying this, Aaron. Contact me. Yeah, if anyone needs to talk to someone about something, like you can t- contact me, you can t- contact Aaron. Uh, you know, uh, we understand that like shit gets hard, and if you need someone to talk to, we are here. And Aaron, today you wanted to share real quick a personal story about something you experienced last week. Well, look, number one, uh, 
I am diagnosed bipolar, manic depressive with suicidal tendencies. So uh, this has been this way for uh, my adult life. Uh, I don't want to get into too much other shit right now. We we can get into it maybe eventually. I don't know that I'm ready exactly right now. But look, if somebody wants to talk to me personally, we can do that. You have my social media stuff. Uh, talk to Greg. I know he's open to it. And again, he said that's how we connected. And it's true. We uh, took a long road trip one time. And uh, his mother had passed away pretty closely to the time that my mother had passed away. And there was, there was a lot... Ooh. Like, I'm gritting my teeth right now. There was a lot of issues there. And uh, there wasn't many people I could talk to, but I could talk to Greg, and Greg could talk to me. And I always will love Greg and appreciate for the, the, the time that we took, that he took to talk with me about that. So now, let's get on to, uh, I'll tell you this story the other day. I was on my way to work, my real job, and um, there was somebody that was actually who had hung themselves from a tree with bed sheets. And we saw this. Uh, a lot of the clients that I work with, I work with uh, a lot of clients that are developmentally disabled, and they saw this as well on their bus into the facility that I work at. Uh, there, So this person, and I don't know who this person was. I'm not sure. It was at the building next door to where I work. But... They felt that there was no way out. There was no one to turn to. There was no one they could talk to. That they, The only way to leave the situation that they were in that was so bad was that they took their own life. And I, I don't know if they have anybody else to talk to. I don't know. I don't know their situation. But I know that... <sighs> It reminds me of this quote that I read in a book one time called The Princess Bride. Life ain't always fair, but it's fairer than death. So live your life, but if you're thinking about death, maybe it's not fair to you, but there's others too that it might not be fair to that you may not even think care about you. You, you got to open up. You got to make the talk. I had the difficult uh, uh, speech with my kids that night about making sure that you don't take your life, that if you feel like you're backed into a corner, if you feel like there's nowhere to go, if you feel there's no one to turn to, there still is. And I told them, you could talk to me, you could talk to uh, uh, someone close, you could talk to a teacher, you could talk to a friend, they could talk to Greg, they could talk to Soda Pop Johnson, any of my people that are like really close with me and that... Or even if it's somebody that that you would never expect. It's just, it's time to talk if you don't feel like there's anywhere to go. Let's talk. Could have said it better myself. This was a very serious episode. Started out very lighthearted, ended pretty heavy. But you know what? Sometimes you got to talk about the more serious issues, man, because people are dealing with problems out there. But you know what? Next week, there ain't going to be no problems. You know why? Why? Because we're going to be talking about hamburgers and everyone Ooh, likes a good it. goddamn hamburger don't they uh, and we're going to talk about some them. of the best hamburgers you can get out there okay from a little restaurant that i love called grill them all based, i can't wait to go based out of los angeles california let me tell you real quick yeah um you brought me back the uh little smell good thingy gimmick uh in my car it's called an air freshener an air freshener yeah. right you, you gotta forgive me my <laughs> mind's all uh i'm in a dark place and yeah. i'm trying to get out sure. um but my son colton came to me and he said dad where's this cool cheeseburger air freshener from and i said it's grill them all it's in los angeles am i right los angeles yeah okay so he says he says can we go there sometime and i said i, I don't know why and he goes well if you got an air freshener from there and they follow your podcast Maybe they'll give us free food. Well, and I've never flown on a plane before, <laughs> so you got to buy the plane ticket. That's it. That's get why. A, that's hotel, why I text you and asked you where, get a, what get a the hotel, best hotel, rent a car, are. yeah, uh, all of that to get get a free meal. Worth it. Worth it for sure, because it's one of the best burgers, probably the best burger I've ever had in my life. And I'm going to sit down to talk to Ryan Harkins, who yeah. not only is a Cleveland boy like ourselves here, 
not only does he own one of the coolest restaurants, but he's a huge wrestling fan. If you're thinking to yourself, well, I don't know if I want to listen to an interview with someone that's not a wrestler next week. I'm telling you, if you don't listen to next week's episode, you're missing out because Ryan has got some stories. He's not like your stereotypical, I just love WWE guy. Like he's a big deathmatch dude. And we, we get into some cool subjects like like deathmatch wrestling and, and Onita, stuff I haven't talked on the podcast about yet. And it, it just he's such a cool dude. He came up in the punk rock scene here in Cleveland, he traveled with some bands for a long time. He was on a Food Network show for a while, which is yeah, why you know, I got, love my Food Network yeah, shows, so, which is why Grill Mall started to get so much success. And just he busts his ass DIY from day one. You'll, you'll really love Ryan's story. So I encourage you to come back next week and every week, download the podcast wherever you like to download podcasts, including iTunes. And you know, do me a favor. Leave a fucking five star review, you know that ra- it raises up the rankings a little bit and like makes us give it get a little more visibility out. And there. give us a comment, yeah. give us a review, tell us if you love us or hate us or yeah. what we could do to to make you listen more or I, I don't know whatever. And also, I think above all else, we love you. Yeah. No matter who you are. So if you are dealing with some shit. Like we talked about earlier. Yeah. Reach out. Yes, absolutely. And uh, you know what. We've done enough rambling. This is the longest outro we've ever done. So that's it for this week. Come back next week. We're going to have a good time. And like I said, if you need us, we're here. Peace out. I'm sorry. I love you. Super kick.